And we are live with today's SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. Well, this is our pre-show. We now have not less than nine minutes. Got a few. Got to get it in there. We were having a a slight problem getting YouTube to recognize me, and then I realized it's because I did something wrong. So I did it right, and everything works fine. Oh, not really running late is just running. That's sort of how things work around here. But everything looks okay. We've got uh, cameras look good. Recording is going. I've already done the podcast intro. Streaming looks exceptional. I forgot to take a picture. There is a, it, where I live, we lost internet connectivity because the city dug up part of the street and hit the line for the cable modem, for the cable company. So all the entire cable was cut. So the cable company had to come out and this went under a road. And so they ended up putting the cable on top of the road and put this protector, quote unquote, on top of the cable. And it works. It, it's been working fine for over a week at this point. But the, the protector has slowly started coming apart, leaving a cable in the middle of the street that people have been driving over. So I had to go over to the neighbor's house and myself sort of cover it all up again because I didn't want it to break in the middle of doing this. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't. We'll see how it goes. But so far, so good. We're all right. We're up and running anyway. Uh, am I going to the Greek Week Festival? I don't believe this year I am going. And by the way, it's a, it is a madhouse. It is crazy there. They do Greek pretty strong there at the... Uh, at the Greek Orthodox Church here in town. You got to watch for that. If you if you ever get a chance also in Florida um and you're near Tampa, you should go up to uh to the Greek areas that are just north of there. Uh it's amazing at the uh, the sponge docks. Uh which is really a lot of fun too. And amazing food. Amazing food. So that's uh that's the way it goes. All right, let's check and make sure we are ready to do whatever it is we're doing today. I think we are. Let's check our this VVox info for those of you wondering about it. It's also the professormaster.com slash QA. Let's pause that. All good is here. Hey, everybody. Hey, chat room. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We got Security Plus questions coming at you today. They're all brand new questions. We'll figure this out as we go along. I think I'm, oh, I should probably start the presentation there. That looks good. What else we got going on here? I think we're in pretty good shape. I think we've got all of the different things in a row. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. What's the worst that can happen, right? Folks are checking in from Jamaica. We've got South Africa and England and Colorado and Ghana and uh, Utah. A lot of folks, Hunts, Huntsville, Alabama. Thanks for being here. Uh, why sending the private key along with a password in the mail body is wrong? <laughs> oh, why Why would you send anything? Uh, in a, it's a fine question, and it's actually a pretty good question. Why would you not do that? Uh, we can talk about that maybe in the after show. There's Florida and D.C. and Detroit, Michigan. We've got New Hampshire. California is here. Portugal. New Jersey is here. Virginia. London. You're not saying which one. I'm going to just take a guess at which one it could be. Um, Montreal. See, Canada's checked in. This is all good. And look, North Korea checking in. Who knew? In the chat room. It's on the internet. It, it has to be right. It has to be true. So, well, in a job interview, they asked why you wouldn't send a private key in an email. Uh, along with, what was it? Private key and what was the other piece? <laughs> what was the other piece? I have to scroll up now. And a password. In the male body. Yeah, that's a bad idea. Super bad idea. I, I'm assuming, of course, that no one's uh, encrypting that email message. It would be kind of hard to encrypt a message if they're sending the key in the message itself. So that's that's fantastic. That's, that's pretty good. Pretty good. All you have to do is do a packet capture with Wireshark, capture the email transfer, and click the one button in Wireshark that reconstructs the flow, and you'll see the entire email. You could pick it out from the data from the hex dump, too, if you really wanted to be, you know, detailed with it. You could do that. So you've got you got options. All right. We're going to get things about ready to go. We got four minutes, four minutes. 
Four minutes, Mr. Sinatra. We'll get things started here. We've got um, Security Plus today. Security Plus to end the week, although it's not really the end of the week, is it? Sort of not. Um, sort of is and it sort of isn't. We're, we're approaching that end. We're, we're wistfully looking towards Friday. <laughs> and we don't generally do live streams on Friday. We used to do our live streams on the weekend. And uh, we don't do a lot of those anymore either. So I have my weekend. Is Mrs. Professor Messer working in IT? She is not. She is uh, the vice president of our company. That's what she primarily does. And uh, her, her uh, former career was one in medicine. So no longer working in medicine, now sort of working in medicine. She has to take care of me. <laughs> It's a, it's a worse problem than she had before. <laughs> so that's it. Well, I have a recording of the live stream. As always, every live stream is automatically available on a replay on YouTube immediately afterwards. So I don't even have to touch anything. You just come back uh, about five minutes after we're done, and there will be an entire stream ready for you to watch. And you can, of course, go back in time and look at I have uh, YouTube playlists and an index on my website of all of the previous study groups. So you can always... Follow those to find the previous ones, which is good for Security Plus. We're up on the 601, and the 601 exam has been around for three years. So you've got about three years of Security Plus live streams to go back and have a look at if you'd like. That's that's at least something, right? Um, I know. Look at that. Thanks, uh, Malk, for the 800,000 subscriber comment. We were hoping it would hit this month. I don't generally like to toot my horn too much. These numbers are interesting for us to watch and sort of enjoy, and we applaud when it hits those round numbers because it's so much fun. Um, but that's that's one of those one of those things where I like to think it's not the fact that the number is there that's important; it's everything that got us to that number is the important part, and that's where that came from. What mouse is that? That it's an enormous mouse, isn't it? It's a big one. That's a that's a monstrously sized mouse. My entire hand fits on the mouse. Nothing touches the actual desk. And uh, this is called a, literally called a hand shoe mouse. It's as big as, as a shoe and your hand fits on it. It's the hand shoe mouse, which is great for using this. Um, it is not a trackball. It's a traditional mouse. It's just huge. And it's not great for gaming because it's so big. It's hard to make fast movements. But for your normal daily live stream type things, it's fantastic. If you want to see all the stuff we have on our uh, on the on the desk here, it's at professormesser.com slash studio. So you can have a look at that. It's not trackball though, it's just an optical mouse. This one's wired. They just came out with a new model that's wireless Bluetooth. And I was thinking of uh, trying that one out because and it, and it's um, ambidextrous. You could convert it between a left hand and a right hand mouse. This is this older version I have, you have to choose when you purchase it which hand you would like to have. Um, and and I, I, there are times when I use both. I use or, or use either. Sometimes I'll use a right-hand mouse. Sometimes I use a left-hand mouse. It's a long story. But uh, this works great. It's a fantastic mouse. And it works. I've used it for years and years and years and years. years. It's just phenomenal. Oh, we're here at the top of the hour. Why did I turn that up that high? There we go. And it's time to get our live stream content together instead of me talking about the mouse so much. Uh, let's get that done. Uh, I need a green light. Where's our green light? There it is. That's the green light. That looks good. This looks good. I think it's time for a live stream, everybody. What do you think? Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October 2023 Professor Messer SY0601 Security Plus Study Group. This is our study group where I take questions from the Security Plus exam. And if you are here live, you're able to answer those questions with us. We've got a lot to go through today. I have all brand new questions, as usual, from the Security Plus exam. And we've got quite a bit of content we can talk about today. First, let me tell you, if you are here live, how you can participate with us and be able to answer these questions. What you want to do is pop open a new browser window, and you can go to the link at your bottom of the screen here, professormesser.com slash QA. 
if you would like to answer these. I'll put up a question here in just a moment. You'll be able to answer that one. In the meantime, I have a question available on the screen. That question is asking, where are you joining from? And we've got a map there. And you can put your virtual push pin into the map to be able to answer that question. You'll also notice that you can uh, join us using the VVOX app, V-E-V-O-X dot A-P-P. -P. And the ID for this particular session is 171-223-495. It's the session that we will be using today. Now, if you've done all of that correctly, I'm going to put a question on the screen, and we're going to vote on it to see how we do. Of course, always with these questions, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. Instead, we're going to look at this question, which is a question from last month. So it should look familiar. Now, if it, this is one, this is our only question that you're going to get that is one that you've seen before. All the other questions today will be brand new. This question asks, which of the following would be the best way to transfer data to a SIM? Is that IPsec, Syslog, HTTPS, SSH, or SFTP? Let's see if I can use this again. Which of the following would be the best way to transfer data to a SIM? Is that IPsec, Syslog, HTTPS, SSH, or SFTP? You think you know the answer. Either follow the VBOX app link on your screen or follow the link at professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. This will be something that we will use as we go through here. Also, I'll remind you as we are going through this, you can also uh, ask a question for our after show using this VBOX front end. So this might be a very useful thing. for If you think of a question sometime in this first hour that you would like me to perhaps answer in the second hour, feel free to submit it on the extra tab that is on your screen. I'm thinking the tab is on your screen. I'll make sure in a moment that that's really the case. Thanks very much for being here. We've got uh, a lot of things going on with Security Plus right now. If you're not familiar, we'll talk more about this in just a moment. But we do have a great deal of information you're able to get for Security Plus and all of our courses on our website, on YouTube, and in other locations. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, what are you waiting for? We've got a subscription there you can plug into. All of our videos are there absolutely free. No registration is required. Simply visit professormesser.com slash YouTube, and you can do that. We've also got a weekly pop quiz question for Security Plus. It's on the, the site formerly known as Twitter. I'm not sure how to describe it. We're, should we just call it X at this point? But go to professormesser.com slash Twitter. I'll have to make a new link for that one. I kind of like the Twitter link myself. And we have professormesser.com slash Instagram if you would like the the same question, but with a pretty picture to go along with it, because that's what Instagram does. Also let you know that we are going to talk today about the SY0601. The 601 exam has been around since November the 20th or November the 12th of 2020, and it will be retiring not July 20, yeah, July 2024, July 31st, 2024. I should have put the actual date on there because it has now been announced by CompTIA that that is the retirement date. So the good part is if you have been studying for your 601 exam, you have 60 SY0601 books, you have uh, the videos that you've watched, you've got course notes and practice exams and labs and everything else, keep using those because this exam will still be available until July of 2024, which gives you plenty of time to finish up your studies, take that exam, pass that exam, and earn your Security Plus certification. And as soon as you do that, even though the exam is retiring in July 2024, once you pass the exam, doesn't matter what the retirement date of the exam is, you're now Security Plus certified for three years. So a good, very important consideration for all of this. It's a single exam, 90 minutes long, with a maximum of 90 questions. You might get fewer than 90 questions. The score that you need to earn is a 750 on a scale from 100 to 900. That's not exactly straightforward, is it? But I think that's intentional the way they do things at CompTIA. That's the score you need, a 750. And it's a combination of multiple choice-based questions and performance-based questions. And we will look at both types of questions in our study group today. As many of you are probably aware, there is a new Security Plus exam that is coming very soon. As a matter of fact, 
That exam is the SY0701, and it will be released on November the 7th. So as we sit here in October, the end of October 2023, we've got a couple of weeks, and suddenly there will be a new exam available. But don't worry, your 601 exam will also be available until July. So there will be this six- or seven-month time frame where both exams can be taken, and you can simply choose whichever one you would like. Really doesn't matter as long as you pass the one that you've studied for. Now, what you'll find is that the 701 materials would uh, will not really have a large availability right out of the gate. We will have videos, and we will have course notes, and we will have other study materials available, but not everything will be available on the CompTIA site or other places. Usually it takes a number of months for all of those things to phase in. Uh, but you've got the 601 that you can continue to study where there are plenty of study materials, so that's not a problem. Again, it's a single exam. Nothing changes with the format. The passing score is still 750. The number of questions is still a maximum of 90. And yes, some people in the exam or in the chat room were asking, what is the scale like 100 to 900? So you start at 100? Yes. You do not start at zero. You start at 100, and you could have a maximum of 900. I think the point is to make it a little more difficult to reverse engineer. The format of this exam is exactly the same as the 601. They have changed the domains. There's different information that will be asked on the 701. But the formatting of the questions is very similar with performance-based questions and multiple-choice-based questions. They are all there on this uh, newer 701 exam. It's going to be a, uh, a good exam. We can talk more about the details in the after show if you'd like. But one of the questions always comes up is, should you wait? If this is coming out in a couple of weeks, why don't we just wait to take that exam? Well, that's great for anyone who might be competing with you for a security-related job because you don't have your certification yet, and they do. So waiting for a certification is almost never the right response. Now, there are big differences between the 601 exam and the 701 exam, and you might want to look at the exam objectives for both of those so that you can determine which one might be a better fit for you. I have my own opinions of this, and we can talk in the after show if you would like. Feel free to submit a message or a question for the after show asking about that, and I'll be glad to cover at least my perspective of these because I've already shot all of my new videos for this new course. I know exactly what is on this course. I've been working on it for months. I'm looking forward to making these available to you, and I do have my own opinions of what is different between these two exams. I have extensive information on those. We also have uh, a lot of information that we're going to cover on the 601 continuing, because it's still around until July. We're not dropping the 601. In fact, it usually takes a number of months or so to get the 701 uh, exam uh, live streams going. So that's one of the things. So everything is sh going to show up in November. A lot of things will show up in November. There will be a lot to go through. So we will talk all about those details probably in the after show, I would expect. I will let you know that we have extensive SY0601 study materials available today. It is available on my website at professormesser.com slash 601SB. Of course, all of our videos are available to watch for free on YouTube. No registration, no nothing is hidden, nothing is behind a paywall. You can simply go to YouTube and watch our entire course, and the same thing will apply to the 701 as well. That's the something that seems to work okay for us, and it works okay for you, so we're going to keep doing that. So plenty to work on there. Of course, on our website, we have course notes and practice exams and so much more. You're free to look at all of those at professormesser.com slash 601SB for our success bundle. Also let you know that there will be an audio replay available of this live stream. It will be in a podcast format. You can find it at professormesser.com slash podcast. And we have our A plus network plus and security plus study groups archived there. You can add them to your favorite podcast listening program. We're also in the most popular podcast indexes. So uh, if you're going out to Apple Podcasts or you just want to listen uh, in a streaming service like Spotify, we're there as well. So you just look for Professor Messer and you'll find everything listed in that audio format. If you would prefer a video replay, that's, of course, available on YouTube. And if you wait about a day, you will see that there will be a series of timestamps that are almost magically created and added to our videos, but it's not magic at all. It's my marketing manager, Lori, who's watching this on the replay. Hi, Lori. Uh, she is going through and putting in these timestamps 
because the best way to do that is to have someone watching and listening and doing it accurately. And uh, that, I think, is uh, sort of a watchword of what we do here is that uh, what, the, what humans can do is so much more advanced than anything that might be automatic these days. So that is what we would use is that uh, YouTube link. Just simply look into the YouTube video description and you will find all of that. Also, let you know that when we're not doing these live streams, you can join us on our chat rooms on Discord. Simply visit professormesser.com slash Discord, and you can, uh, or you might want to choose the icons at the upper right of my website. Either one will get you to my Discord server. And if you'd still uh, like more information, you can always send me a note. But everybody is there on Discord. We have a great community there. There are people constantly studying for their exams. So whether you're studying A+, Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus, or even other certifications, there's some very smart people on that Discord that can help you to find out more at professormesser.com slash Discord. Also let you know that there will be a time when you'll need to take this exam. And if you're in the U.S. or Canada or U.S. territory, you can get a discounted voucher by visiting professormesser.com slash vouchers. And if you purchase the voucher from my site, you get a free bonus that you won't get anywhere else. It is my Exam Hacks ebook where I've taken all of the tips and tricks that I've learned through the years of taking more than 20 different IT certification exams, and I've collapsed all of those tips and tricks into one single document can find out more at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Now let's have a look at that question I asked earlier. The question asks, which of the following would be the best way to transfer data to a SIM? Would that be IPsec, syslog, HTTPS, SSH, or SFTP? Now let's see how you answered this question. We're going to close the poll, and we can see that the answer that you have selected, by far, 62% of you say the answer is syslog. 18% say SFTP. 11% say SSH. And of course, we have single digits for HTTPS and IPsec. Well, if we're transferring data to a SIM, that must be data that is in a log. Everything on the network is logging data. You're, uh, you're logging data in your firewalls, your switches, your routers, your servers, your VPN concentrators. Everything that's plugged into the network probably has a log file. And you can transfer that log file in a very standard format called syslog. That is one that is a format used almost exclusively for log transfer. It's one that is very commonly implemented into switches, routers, and other devices. And the SIM, of course, is all ready to be able to receive that syslog data. So even though the data itself may be very different between all of those devices, the process of transferring the log file is very standardized. And that standard is called syslog. That's the answer that we were looking for for that first question. 62% of you got that one absolutely correct. SFTP is a file transfer protocol. It's in the name of it itself, the secure version of FTP. But that is not what is commonly used to transfer data to a SIM. A SIM receives syslog data uh, almost exclusively. It is so huge in the amount of data that will be sent. SSH is a protocol for secure shell, very commonly associated with connecting to a command line console on a remote device. That is not a way to transfer data to a SIM. HTTPS, also not a way to transfer data to a SIM. You won't even have that option inside of your firewalls, your routers, your switches, your VPN concentrators, your servers, and else, all those other devices. And IPsec is a method of creating a tunnel and perhaps even sending encrypted data through that tunnel through a VPN, commonly used for site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, but it is also not a way that you would transfer data to a SIM. The only answer here that makes any sense, the one you should use and the one that is the best way to transfer data is indeed syslog. And 62% of you got that one absolutely correct. I think some of you remembered that from last month. Well done with that one. So that is our rewind question. It's a multiple choice question. You can see there was a quest there was a question and multiple answers to choose from, but not all of the questions on your exam will be in this format. In fact, the first handful of questions you get on your exam will be in a format that CompTIA calls 
a performance-based question. Performance-based questions are effectively anything that isn't multiple choice. So it might be fill in the blank. They might put you at a command prompt and ask you to perform a function. It might be a matching question. You might have to put things in order. It might be drag and drop. There are a lot of things that are involved in a performance-based question. But the thing you should know is that performance-based questions are simply asking you the same information as a multiple choice based question. They're just asking you in a different way. The questions are still coming from the CompTIA exam objectives. And if you know the objectives, it really doesn't matter how the questions are posed. You'll have no problem answering those. So I have for you, as I do with all of our live streams, I have a performance based question for you. This one, we're going to pretend that we are at a Linux command prompt. And the question that I have for you is, on this Linux server, combine the contents of both files to a single document. And ideally, you would be using one of the commands that is available or that you should know from the Security Plus exam objectives. This will be one of the last times I get to do a command line option for a performance-based question because there are no command lines on the 701. We were talking earlier about that transition. There's a lot of things that have changed in the Security Plus exam. And so this is for everyone studying for their 601 for sure, because this will not be something you need to know for the 701. So on this Linux server, combine the contents of both files to a single document. You can see there are two files here. There's one called first.txt and one called second.txt. I guess that really describes what the differences are in those two. One is the first file, and one is the second file. It's literally in the names. So uh, that is that is something you should consider when you're looking at this question. What would you type in at that command prompt to combine the contents of both of those files into a single document? And if you just give me the name of the command you would use, I could give you partial credit for that. But there is some interesting things you can do with this command to combine those files into a single document. I worry that I've given you too much already. And the chat room's wondering, what? Did I say there were no command lines in the 701? I did say that. No command lines in the 701. At least it's not in the exam objectives. It's not in the exam objectives. It's not on the exam. That Of that, we know. We know all of that is, is true and legit, because that's how CompTIA does things. There's quite a bit that has changed on this exam. So I will absolutely talk through those in the after show if you'd like more details of them. We can go through the entire piece of this and kind of break down what these happen to be. So let's now uh, focus on other types of things that we will be doing. Everything at this command line is important. And I can see a number of you putting your answers in. As always, of course, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. We're going to approach this as if we were taking the exam ourselves. And we're waiting to see what the differences are with these. So let's see what you think the answers are. Well, I, I can't really put them on the screen because we are doing this. And we start breaking through and, and understanding more about what we would work on. Uh, but let's see how we did with this. So I'm going to take a quick peek as to the things you guys are typing in. You guys are doing great with this one uh, and, and what you're typing in. I think there's some of this that's, uh, that's very good. And we can talk about some of these parameters and the differences in all of these. So we, a, lot of, a lot of people getting this one just spot on and being able to work through it. So let's see how you did with this one. I'll give you what I think the answer is. And we'll see how you do with this one. So let's go through and look at my answer of on this Linux server, how I would combine the contents of both files to a single document. And if we look, these are the first.txt and the second.txt. So at the command prompt, here's what I would type in. I would cat. Cat is the command we were looking for. Cat stands for concatenate or it stands for kitty cat, one of those two things. I think it's concatenate in Linux, though, if I had to guess. That cat command will take input and put simply, as the term concatenate uh, does imply, it puts them together. It puts one after the other in that same format. So it's, it is connecting or joining these documents together. So cat uh, with first.txt and second.txt 
named out in the command line will concatenate these two files together. The other thing that we mentioned in this command line, though, is I would like them combined into a separate file. If you didn't put anything after second.txt and you hit Enter, it would put everything on the screen, which may be what you wanted. But we mentioned wanting it in a file. So we're going to do a redirection of this by using a greater than sign. And that greater than sign moves it into a single file called combined.txt. Combined.txt. And you can call it anything.txt. But that is the command line that we were looking for. Now, I notice a number of you said cat is what you would use. And you did put them into the command lines. Some of you used two greater than signs together, greater than, greater than, which would put it into a file. But if that file already existed, it would add it to the end of that file, which may not necessarily be what you want. You may want this to be a brand new file. So make sure you know the differences between a single greater than sign and two greater than signs. It would be pretty important to do that. There are other ways to do this, but concatenate is really the best way to combine those two things together and put them into a single document. But if you think you know of another way to do it in Linux, there's certainly, I can think of a number of different ways to do this because you have a lot of different options to be able to pull these in. And I could probably give partial credit for those too, or even full credit if it's one that works. But cat is one of those terms on the 601 exam you do need to know. It's probably the best choice for being able to do this. And in fact, I show when I performed a cat of combine.txt, it has the part at the top on the 601. And then the second file has the domain information at the bottom. And you can see they are both in the same file. The cat command worked perfectly. It combined both the first and second dot text and put them into combined dot text. That was the answer that we were looking for was the kitty cat command. The cat command, if you were ever looking to cat to a screen. That's one way to do it. And there's to the other file. So you've got different options. We show you how to do that in our video of concatenating these together. And of course, if you are working through all of these, I think that's that's an important consideration. The folks in the chat room are saying, I, I mentioned partial credit before. That's the credit that I give you. On your exam, you might get partial credit. Or as CompTIA says, they might not give you partial credit. That's really up to them. So the partial credit or not partial credit is something that they get to decide. And by the way, they never tell you. So ultimately, it really doesn't matter whether they get partial credit or not. You'll never know if they give you partial credit or not. So that's a, an important thing to remember, too. Concatenate is what we were looking for, the cat command. And if you chose that one, that is the one that would be able to do exactly what we're looking at there with the concatenate command. Well done. That was a lot of you. As I look through the submissions that you sent in, uh, a lot of you came up with this one. I want to address some others that were in here, though. There were a few others that people chose. Uh, CH mod was something that people chose, but that would simply change the mode or the different security settings associated with a single file. It doesn't combine any files together. Uh, other commands, some folks were using the ls command which would list the document names on the screen, but it would not list or combine the information contained within the documents. So the ls command would not be used for this either. And almost a, a huge percentage, I would say over 80% of you got the cat command right away. So well done with that one. That was the right answer. That's what we were looking for. And you did an exceptional job with our performance-based question of the month. Let's now shift gears back to our multiple choice base questions. This next question on our list asks, which of the following provides a framework for better understanding the techniques which may be used by a potential attacker? Would that be MITER attack, cyber kill chain, OSI, IEEE, or diamond model? Which of the following provides a framework for better understanding the techniques which may be used by a potential attacker? Is that MITRE attack, cyber kill chain, OSI, IEEE, or diamond model? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen at professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. As always, please, no answers in the chat room. Please, no hints in the chat room. And we'll be able to break this down and see what the answers might be. Feel free to use the links on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA 
or you can follow the vbox.app link that is on your screen to break those down too. So hopefully this is one that you're familiar with. Uh, there are a number of different options on the screen. And everything that's on the screen, by the way, is a real thing. So I didn't make any of these up. That's also something you should consider. If you notice that there's an answer and you don't recognize what that happens to be, or you couldn't explain that particular answer to someone else, make a note of that so you can go back into your study materials and make sure you're familiar with uh, that particular bit of text. It might help you on the exam. So let's see how you do with this one. I'm going to let a couple more answers come in. A lot came in very quickly with this one. So I'm interested to see what we really chose for this particular question. Again, the question asks, which of the following provides a framework for better understanding the techniques which may be used by a potential attacker? Is that the MITRE attack, the cyber kill chain, OSI, IEEE, or diamond model? Let's see what you chose on this poll. We can see that 66% say that it is a MITRE attack. So two thirds of you believe it's that one connection. 13% say it's diamond model. 9% say it's, uh, cyber kill chain, 7% for OSI, and 3% for IEEE. Well, if you're someone who is really trying to understand how are these attackers getting into our network when they perform one of these types of attacks, what's really happening? For example, you may be reading in this month's Microsoft patches that there was a buffer overflow attack or there was a SQL injection. Well, how do you know what those are? How would you even know where to start with understanding the details of what all of those could be? So what you would go to by default, and I think this is an exceptional resource, is the MITRE attack framework. This is from the MITRE Corporation. Uh, they have an extensive framework available on their website at attack.mitre.org. And this MITRE attack really contains, it's almost like an encyclopedia of techniques and operations used by attackers. So if you ever want to learn more about any of these attack types, it can be an exceptional resource. It's really useful to go through at any time to learn more about some of the ways that someone can gain access into your network. There's many different ways. And they've tried to document every possible way that we're aware of so that you can be prepared and you can look to see if there's anything within your infrastructure that may need to be updated or prepared. Here's a better view of the framework. You could say they see there's extensive details in here, reconnaissance, resource development, initial access, execution, and persistence is listed in here. Quite a bit in here that you can pull from. This is all interactive. You can click on different aspects of this. It will move it into it. A lot to go through here. These attack types can be very informational and a lot of great ideas here to go through. And in fact, the MITRE attack kill chain is the answer we were looking for here. It provides a list of techniques. It helps you understand how these attackers are getting into your network. And it's a way that you could help protect your network more by understanding more about how these attackers are thinking and the techniques that they use. This MITRE attack framework is a great one to use. Other frameworks on this list are the cyber, cyber kill chain framework, which is more of a description of the process that attackers use more generically. There's six or seven different layers of the cyber kill chain, depending on which flavor of it you're using. The different different uh, layers of that kill chain, the different processes that are used, um, the details of that are not as important as what the cyber kill chain is referencing. Make sure you know that for your 601 exam. The diamond model is another type of model for understanding how to take an, an attack and work backwards to discover how did they get in. So it, this is one where you're understanding techniques which may be used by a potential attacker. That's MITRE attack. The diamond model is how you can take after the attack and maybe work your way back into understanding how did they get into our network. So that's more of an after the fact scenario. So diamond model would not be the best choice for this particular question. The last two answers we have here are not frameworks at all. The IEEE is an organization uh, for the engineering. And of course, they create the standards that we use for networking both wired and wireless, along with many others, that allow us to have manufacturers that are creating products that will interoperate with each other. So IEEE, a very good example of that. And they have the different 802. If you're in 
the networking world, it's the 802 standards. But of course, the IEEE manages many, many standards across many, many different types of, of infrastructures and technologies. OSI is also not a framework. That is more of a model that we use to describe the traffic and the way that we have information flow across our networks. So in this particular case, OSI is not what we were looking for either. The answer by far, and 66% of you, two-thirds of you got this one absolutely right, is indeed the MITRE attack framework. That's what we were looking for, and that's the one that you should know for your 601 exam. Let's do another multiple choice based question. The next question on our list asks, which of the following would be categorized as an operational security control? Is that security policy, firewall, hot site, warning sign, or security guard? Which of the following would be categorized as an operational security control? Is that security policy? Firewall, hot site, warning sign, or security guard. As always, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We instead want to go to the links on our screen. Either visit professormesser.com slash QA to answer this question or follow the vvox.app links that are on your screen for this particular question. Uh, these security controls are both on the 601 and the 701 exam. So if you are trying to get a little bit of a head start on the 701, this is certainly something you should know about. Uh, we will, of course, have many 701 videos available for you on day one. There's a lot that's going on here. I'm editing videos every day and putting them into a big pile that's going to go on the YouTube, and you'll be able to access those no problem. Uh, it was good to get all of those put into the editing can so that I can then concentrate on getting them out to you. Um, a lot of good stuff in there, too. A lot of, uh, lot of good things in the 701 exam. Uh, they're really trying to position, because at CompTIA, there used to be only the Security Plus exam. Then they added on CISA. Then they added on uh, the, the other CASP and other types of exams. Uh, so what they're trying to do, I believe, is really make each of those exams have a different focus. So you're going to find this new 701 exam very different than 601. I didn't mention this earlier, but if you are studying and your intention is to take the 701 exam, do not study from 601 materials. I beg of you, do not do that. You will you'll set yourself up for failure. Only study from materials that match the version number of the exam that you're planning to take. If you're planning to take the 701 exam, then you should only study from materials specifically made for the 701 series. That's pretty important. The estimated release date for the 701 videos is the release date of the exam, November the 7th. So everything was going to show up on November the 7th. I believe that's a, that's pretty common across the industry. Let's do another question. Uh, let's not do another question. Let's see how you answered this question. You uh, answered the question that asks, which of the following would be categorized as an operational security control? Is that a security policy? a firewall, a hot site, a warning sign, or a security guard. Let's close the poll and see how you did. 42% of you say security policy. 32% of you say a firewall. Then we have 18% that say a security guard. 6% say a hot site. And then less than a percent say a warning sign. So we want to know about operational security. These are the control categories that we're dealing with. And operational control is one that are implemented by people. We don't often think of technology as having people inside of it. But in fact, that's exactly what an operational control is focusing on. So if you are a security guard, you're part of an operational security control. If you're someone who is creating an awareness program, you are creating an operational security control. So those are the important parts of this. There are three major categories on the 601, managerial, operational, and technical. These are broken out a little bit more in the 701, but you'll see that in the new videos. Uh, the, tech, the ones that we're focusing in on are those operational controls. So if they're implemented by people, that is the real key, we need to look and see from our answers which ones were implemented by people. And you can see by far... We look at all of these. We've got security policy, which is not something that – that's not a person. Security policy is not a human that is doing something that is more of a piece of paper. It'd be something more along the lines of a managerial control. So we wouldn't put that into the operational control category. A firewall is a technical thing. 
It's not a not a physical firewall. I realize there are physical firewalls, but the physical firewalls are not people, and the technical firewalls are not people. So we would put that into the category of a technical control. A hot site, hot site, a hot site is also a building, and in most cases, a hot site is used as a uh, a technical failover. So I would put that into a technical security control as well. We've also got a warning sign. Hardly anybody chose that one. A warning sign would definitely be a managerial type control because it is something that is placed as part of a policy. It's not got a human uh, piece associated with this. But there is a human, and the human is our security guard. That is an operational security control. 18%, only 18% chose a security guard as the operational security control. These are important things to remember for the exam, not only because we are dealing with, well, absolutely dealing with the idea of understanding what we need to have as far as these different controls are concerned, but you're going to see on the exam, especially the 701, we have different security controls and we are applying them across multiple categories. So kind of interesting to see them broken out that way. If you answered security guard, you would have gotten that one right. 18% of you did choose that answer. That is the one that on, in all of these that are in this list, that's the one that I would also put into the category of an operational security control. So that is exactly where we would go and work through some of these. So hopefully you're familiar with some of those technologies. Maybe it's something that you've used before, but make sure you know those security controls for your exam. So let's talk about, uh, and oh, by the way, I thought I would mention this as well. When we talk about security controls, security controls are not exclusive. So there are certain technologies that can fit into multiple categories, and that is incredibly common. So make sure you're aware of that too, because there might be situations where a security guard turns into a preventive control. Uh, certainly common to see that, but of course, I didn't ask about preventive or preventative, depending on which version of the exam you're looking at. Instead, we were focusing more on operational controls and which one of these would fit only into an operational control. And as you can tell, I chose this very carefully so that only one of these would be operational. So let's see how we do. Uh, well, before we go to our next question, I want to make the, the point, and this is probably something that you've seen before, is this Security Plus exam is big. It's enormous. There is a lot to learn on the topics. In fact, if you look at the 601 exam, it's 177 videos. It's enormous in size. And there are over 21 hours of content on there. What I've done is because I, I realize that's a lot of videos, but there's a lot of information in the exam objectives. Uh, one of the things that I've done is put everything into a single document. It is my 601 course notes. There's where it is. It's 120 pages, and it contains all of the text, all of the important graphics, and all of the tables that are in my videos. So if it's in the video, it's probably in here too. Certainly is one that's going to give you everything in one single document. I have both digital versions. We'll show the digital version on our screen here. There it is. This is the digital version that you see, and you can see it's got extensive details of everything that is in these videos. Some of this may look familiar to you. And there's also a physical version. If you purchase the physical guide, which is a printed book version, it's identical to the digital. And in fact, I give you the digital version for free. So while you're waiting on this to be delivered to you, you can already download and start working on your course notes. And there will, of course, the course notes for the 701 exam are already ready. They're just, they'll be released when that exam is available. Uh, those are all set and working through all of these details. So a lot here working through, a lot to go through. The 601 course notes have extensive details in there around cloud computing and encryption and protocols and risk management and mobile technologies and so much more. If this is something you think might help you with your studies, feel free to visit our site at professormesser.com slash 601CN. That's for our 601 course notes. And uh, we will absolutely have one available to you. All of this, yeah, all of these will continue to be available until there is no longer a 601 exam. So you'll continue to have all of these available into July and be able to get access to the information you need to pass whichever exam version you plan to take. That 601 exam, and I tell you, 
This happens every time we have a transition between these. There will be people taking their 601 exam on the last day it is available on July 31st, I assure you. So don't think that you're going to be the only one studying that 601 version. Oh, no. This is going to be one of the most popular versions for the next six months. And you're going to see a lot of people taking and passing that 601 because you earn the same Security Plus certification. And there's tons of information available to be able to use those. Let's do some more questions. I've got another multiple choice question for you. This question asks, a network administrator has identified a device sending a large amount of traffic to an external IP address. The computer is powered on but the user's on vacation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this traffic? Is it a botnet, a logic bomb, spraying, max spoofing, or skimming? All real things. Again, a question again asks, a network administrator has identified a device sending a large amount of traffic to an external IP address. The computer's powered on, but the user is on vacation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this traffic? Is it botnet, logic bomb, spraying, max spoofing, or skimming? And so read the question very carefully. Read the part that has the question on it very carefully so that you know that you're answering the right one. So that would be good. Um, folks in the chat room, we're talking about 601 and 701 and wondering which version of the vouchers they need. There are no versions of vouchers. If you buy a Security Plus voucher, it's good for any Security Plus exam. Now, I realize on the CompTIA website, they do label them, this is a 601 voucher. This is a 701 voucher. They're the same voucher. Not sure if you even knew that, but it's exactly the same voucher. I, I uh, of course, you get vouchers on my site. I just buy whatever Security Plus voucher they have and make sure it's available to you. So that's uh, that's the part they don't tell you, as if there's a worry about when you would use the voucher. So even if you purchased a voucher today, you were planning to take the 601, and then you realize, I'm not going to be able to make it until July, it's OK. Your voucher is good for a year, and you just take the 701. So that's a, that gives you some flexibility uh, and easy to do. So if you're working through those. Um, and that's that's an important part of this. Your 601 exam is available until the end of July. So feel free to get a voucher and use that anytime. Be able to make that happen. So let's see how you did with this one. A lot of people put in an answer on this one, but it did not go quite as fast as some of the other questions. So I think we we're really thinking about this one. The question asks, a network administrator has identified a device sending a large amount of traffic to an external IP address. The computer's powered on, but the user is on vacation. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this traffic? Is it botnet, logic bomb, spraying, max spoofing, or skimming? Now, let's see how you answered this one. We'll stop the poll, and we'll see. Yes, this is what I was hoping to see. 72% of you, a large number of you, chose one answer, and the answer you chose was botnet. But is that the right answer? We'll find out in a moment. 11% say logic bomb and 11% say max spoofing. That's a two-way tie for second place. And then you have 1% that say spraying and 3% that say skimming. That's effectively a two-way tie for, I'm calling it third place. Some people have correctly told me, no, no. Since you already got three, that's a, a two-way tie for fourth place, I think, or fifth, somewhere in there. Like, no, let's call it third. Let's not make this more complicated. I, I have a hard enough time keeping up. So we're good with that one. But that's a large number, 72% of us. If we round up, we'll say 73. Say the answer is botnet. And that's the answer I would choose as well. The, your user is not there. They are not even on in, in this network. They're not even in the building. They're probably not even in the country. They are on vacation. So they are not on their system. They are not working on the system. Instead, something is sending traffic, a large amount of traffic, to an external IP address, which would be pretty unusual if somebody's not sitting at that computer or having control of that computer. They're not logged in remotely. They're on vacation. So this could be a botnet that is participating in a DDoS or distributed denial of service. It might be somebody who has set up a botnet that's able to relay spam traffic, the very common thing to do with botnets. Maybe they're using it for distributed computing tasks, trying to crack open a, uh, a list of hashes that have passwords inside of them, and they're using all of these botnet computers as a single distributed CPU. 
makes me think that that would be a way to do it. And in some cases, you'll even find there is botnet as a service. You can purchase time on an illegal botnet network and have it do whatever task you would like. Uh, it's crazy that this is the way things have been going. But that is a very good example of how botnets can be used against us. So it's important that we know what these differences are between all of these. So in this question, where the network administrator identified the device sending a large amount of traffic to an external IP address, that's not enough yet. We don't know a lot about that. But we do know after this is that the computer is powered on and the user is on vacation. That should be a warning that something is sending a large amount of traffic through there. So of course, that's what you can think about. And so there must be some other third party service doing this. Now let's see what these happen to be. Let's break through all of these. We know that the answer is botnet. Our second most popular answer was Mac spoofing. Mac spoofing is when you change the Mac address of a device. That's the media access control or the hardware address of a device. That's something you would rarely do. And even changing that to a different MAC address doesn't somehow make it send traffic to an external IP address. Those two things are very different in the way they, they work. MAC spoofing can be used to make your system look as if it is another system or to make your system correspond to what the MAC address expectations are of another system. For example, if you were early on with cable modems, uh, one of the things they had you do was change the MAC address of the cable modem because that was one of the methods they were using to have the cable modem authenticate back to the central office. So you would perform effectively MAC spoofing on your own cable modem. In fact, if you look at your cable modem that you're using at your home, if you have one of those, there's probably an option in there to modify the MAC address of that device that's Mac spoofing. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be sending a lot of traffic to an external IP address. A logic bomb could possibly be an answer here. And I say possibly because maybe this user set a logic bomb in their system. They went on vacation. And they know that at a certain day and a certain time when they're not there, it's going to send a lot of information to the internet. I'm not sure that that's really a bomb. I don't know. Didn't really doesn't say that it caused an outage. It doesn't say that anything was deleted. It doesn't seem like there's anything horrible happening on the local network. And in fact, logic bombs in general are relatively rare. This would not be a very common thing to see on the network. And so when you have the option between choosing botnet or logic bomb, we can look back at this question where it says, which of the following would be the most likely reason? for this traffic. By far, the most likely reason will be botnet over something like a logic bomb, which is relatively rare. Uh, and even then, it's unlikely that you're releasing a logic bomb that transfers data to the internet. That's not a very good bomb. That's the worst bomb ever. So not a great logic bomb answer. And I wouldn't choose that as the most likely reason for this traffic. We also have uh, uh, skimming at 3%. Skimming is a physical method of acquiring someone's credit card information using a physical device connected to a credit card reader. So skimming would not be the answer we were looking for here. And spraying is a method of trying to use the most common passwords or passwords that are known associated with an account, trying them a few times to see if maybe you can catch some low-hanging fruit, catch an account that just how you happen to know the password, or the password was one that was discovered on a different service. And you're trying to see if that password was used by this user on a, di on a third or fourth party service. And that would be a spraying attack. Uh, that's something that would send a little bit of information, maybe try logging on three times. And after that, it stops because it doesn't want to flag itself as a locked account. So spraying would not be a device sending a large amount of traffic. In fact, it's a very small amount of traffic. Somebody's trying to do that. And if they're on your internal network, there's no way somebody from the outside is going to be doing a spraying attack to your system. It would be blocked at the firewall anyway. So that would not be the case either. The only answer here that makes sense, the answer that is the most likely reason for this traffic is indeed botnet. And 72% of you got that one absolutely correct. If you are, are watching this video either live or on a replay, and you would like to earn a one hour of a webinar category CEU, I would love to send you an email that certifies that you were here. But to earn that email, 
you must follow these instructions. Your instructions are you need to go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. When you do that, there's a link for Contact Us. That Contact Us link uh, will bring up a form. On that form, put your name, your email address, and in the subject line, put October 2023. In the body of the message, on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, Max Spoofing. Max Spoofing are the super secret code words of the month. And then if you'd like to put anything else into that message that you would like, I do read through every single one of these. Unfortunately, I'm not able to respond back to every single one of these, but I do try to get everything in there so that you're able to send that Max Spoofing information to me in that body of the message. And I will, of course, send back an email to you that certifies that you are here. And I include a digital signature so that you know no one on that link would be able to change anything in that message without invalidating that digital signature. Again, you need to go to professormesser.com at the top or the bottom of the website. Click Contact Us. Put in your name, your email address, and the body of the message or the, the subject line of the message. Put October 2023. And in the body of the message, on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, Mac spoofing. And I usually get these turned around in about a week or so. So if uh, don't worry that you're not getting a response immediately, I'll sit down with this. I'll go through them a day or, day or so later, and we'll go through each one of those. Well, we have some time left. Let's keep going. I have more questions available. This next question on our list asks, a package delivery receipt includes the signature of the receiving party. Which of the following would best describe the signature on this receipt? Uh, and I, I think there's a number of options available. Those options are something you are, something you have, something you can do, somewhere you are, and something you know. These are all of the things we want to do. We have a package delivery receipt includes the signature of the receiving party. Which of the following would describe the signature on this receipt? Is it something you are, something you have, something you can do, somewhere you are, or something you know? Now, if you think you know the answer, go to professormaster.com slash QA or follow the links to vvox.app on your screen and lock in your answer. Let's see if you happen to know what this one might be. These are obviously, if you're familiar with the exam objectives, these are authentication factors. And there are a number of authentication factors you need to know. Um, and that has changed a bit on the 701 exam. They're slightly different. They include some. They don't include others. So make sure you have a look on the 701 if that's something you want to do and be able to work through these. So hopefully this is one. You've probably even done this before. You've probably had a package appear, and they want you to sign. And you may have not even realized that you were authenticating when you signed that. That's what we do with signatures. We use that as an authentication factor. We just need to know which factor it happens to be, because we might want to have multiple factors which means we would have to choose something different. We'd have to have two or more of these to have multiple authentication factors or multi-factor authentication, as we commonly call it, or MFA or 2FA for two-factor authentication. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, a package delivery receipt includes the signature of the receiving party. Which of the following would describe the signature on this receipt? Is it something you are, something you have, something you can do, somewhere you are, or something you know? Let's close the poll and see how you answered this one. 53%, just over half, say it is something you can do. Not a, not a huge number, but it's certainly a lot more than anything else. We have a two-way tie for second place between something you are and something you have at 17% each. We've got something you know at 9%, and you've got somewhere you are at 1%. Let's see what I think the answer is. If we have a look at my side, I think the answer is... Something you can do, which is what 53% of you said the answer was as well. This is, as the name implies, some type of process or thing that only you can do. Now, at least 
mostly only you can do. A signature is a good example of one of those. So uh, your signature is something that's very unique to you. It would be very difficult to have someone, or at least unusual, for someone to sign your name and have it look exactly like your signature. That would be unusual. There are people that are very gifted at faking a signature, at, at having some type of counterfeit signature with these. But that's a different type of problem. And we can talk more about why certain security factors are better than others. This would be a situation where you would probably use a signature along with something else uh, to be able to do that. So something you can do really is the right answer for these and knowing what it happens to be. Hopefully, that uh, that is one that you can, of course, focus on for yours. And there is um, a time when you would use something you can do. Uh, back in the day, maybe you can ask an old timer about writing checks. These are pieces of paper that you would give to a bank that tells the bank that you've authorized the bank to give that person some money for those of you not familiar with those. Uh, we don't really use them so much anymore. We guess we're, there's still places where you would use an actual physical check, certainly. Uh, but checks use a signature line as the authentication factor for that check. And you may not realize it when you open an account with the bank. They have you sign. Sometimes they have you sign multiple times. And they store that signature so that when they receive a check on your account, they can quickly examine the signature and see if it's one of the signatures that you used when you open the account. And if those match, or if it's reasonable enough that they match, they say that, that check must have come from you. So another way to do that. So uh, a good place where authentication really makes sense. And we have other options here that you did not choose. For example, something you are, something you are is really something about yourself. So something you are might be something biometric, like a, a, a an, um, a, a fingerprint, for example, a fingerprint reader would be able to use something that you are. Something you have would be something that you physically possess. So if you happen to get an authentication app that's on your phone, that is something you have because you're carrying around this phone or even a separate authentication dongle. It's maybe connected to your keychain. And you must have this to be able to read that number off the app. So we consider that something you have. Uh, well, something you know would be something that's in your brain that nobody else would have access to, ideally, I guess. So something like a password is something you know. And then somewhere you are, well, that's somewhere you are. It's physically where are you located in the geography of this universe. Or, and this is also used as an authentication factor, very commonly in addition to other factors. For example, what if somebody logged into your network who was, they were in their office this morning, and then in the logs, you notice they just logged in from China. You're thinking, wait a second, that, that should not happen. So knowing where someone is can be a very useful authentication factor when used in the right way. And you might be on a VPN, but if you're already in the building, why are you using a VPN to connect to China and then back to us? I call shenanigans. Something odd is going on there. Um, so that is a good example of somewhere you are. So of these five different authentication factors, the one we were looking for that includes a signature is indeed something you can do. You have signed that yourself. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable answer for this particular question. And 53% of you thought that as well. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour, but let's try to fit in maybe one or two others. I've got another question for you. This next question on your list says, a user digitally signs all email messages sent to external recipients. Which of the following would be used to provide this functionality? Would it be SAS, IPsec, LDAPS, SMIME, or SRTP? A few things to choose from here. Maybe not the answers you were thinking about when I read the question. The question asks, a user digitally signs all email messages sent to external recipients. Which of the following could be or which of the following would be used to provide this functionality? Is it SAS, IPsec, LDAPS, SMIME, or SRTP? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen to lock in your answer. See if it happens to match what I think the answer was. See, there were some people in the chat room who thought the same thing. Thought I was going to come up with a public-private key type answer. Oh, no. I've asked those before. 
We're going to mix it up a little bit and see if you know more about sending, digitally signing and sending email messages to an external recipient. That's the real question here. So if you know that answer, lock it in. A lot of you locking this one in quickly makes me wonder if indeed we are locking these in and we really know this one. I have to have to see these and be able to work on them. Have See if you happen to know what they are. They are at professormesser.com slash QA or follow the vvox.com link that is on your screen to be able to lock in your question. Yeah, you might be able to do the process of elimination. It's one of the reasons we have performance-based questions on this exam is because even if you didn't know the answer to this one, you have a 20% chance of getting it right. So they want to be able to make you earn some of those extra points. That's the purpose of their performance-based questions. Let's see how you did with this one. The question again asks, a user digitally signs all email messages sent to an external recipient. Which of the following would be used to provide this functionality? Is it SAS, IPsec, LDAPS, SMIME, or SRTP? And if we look at the poll, uh, two-thirds, exactly, 66.666666% say the answer is SMIME. S mime. We also have kind of a four-way tie for second place. SAS at 8%, IPsec at 7%, LDAPS at 6%, and SRTP at 10%, almost 11%. So by far, the, the large number of folks have said it is S mime. S mime, of course, stands for the Secure Multipurpose Internet Mail Extensions. This is a way to send mail with additional capabilities. And it's some, it's a functionality that is commonly built into your email client. So if you look at your Outlook client or maybe use a different kind of email client, there may be an S mime functionality built into that client where you can put your pub private key and have that private and public key pair used for encryption or verification of digital signatures. That information is all based on S mime. There are other ways to transfer mail, but for the purposes of this question, that's the one we were looking for was the S mime question. S mime as the answer that we had. Two thirds of you said that's what I would use. We're talking about email. That is the answer that has anything to do with email because if we go through these others, we'll start at the top. Uh, S A A S or SaaS is software as a service. Software as a service is when you are simply logging on, usually with a browser to a service, usually on the internet. And that service is one where you simply provide a username and password, and the entire application is there for you to use. Although that is very useful and very functional, in fact, maybe the email that you're using is a SaaS-based email, SaaS does not describe the digital signatures that you would assign for external recipients in that email. That's not what SAS is. So that doesn't describe it at all. IPsec, as we mentioned earlier, is a way to create a tunnel, very often an encrypted tunnel between two locations, commonly used for site-to-site -site VPN connections. And that is not something that would digitally sign an email message. That's not going to work either. LDAPS, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol Secure, is a way to reference a database of information a directory, if you will. And that directory is one that allows us to check usernames, validate passwords, or look at configuration options or settings associated with the device on our network. Anything we put in that database, we can access using the LDAP or LDAP-S protocol. And lastly, SRTP, the real-time protocol, the secure version of the real-time protocol is used for voice over IP to be able to transfer voice or video communication using voice over IP protocols that is all for voice over IP communication. Has nothing to do with digitally signing email messages. The answer is indeed S mime. That's what we were looking for. And two thirds of you, 66.67%, got that one absolutely correct. Well done. Well, I know that we've gone an hour at this point, but I want to try to get one more question in. This next question we're going to do comes directly from my practice exams book. If you haven't seen these practice exams book, this is one that I wrote specifically to give you the same feel and the same structure as an actual Security Plus exam. 
The questions we're doing today are practice exams or, or practice tests. They're more of a quick check of how well you know the technology. But the practice exams book is written to give you exactly the same feel and the same structure as the actual Security Plus exam. So this is one that has 380 pages. There are three separate practice exams that have been created in this single book. There are, of course, both digital and physical versions of this book. You can see it's a big book. There's a lot of questions in here with a lot of answers. We have multiple choice questions in here. We have performance-based questions in here. A lot of detail. Let's do a question that comes from our practice exams book. So I have in front of me one, I have the book. It's right here in front of me. This is the digital version of the book. This is on page 13. It's question A31 that's in the book. And again, of course, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. I'll show you how this book works. We have a bunch of questions at the very beginning. This one asks, a security engineer runs a monthly vulnerability scan. The scan doesn't list any vulnerabilities for Windows servers, but a significant vulnerability was announced last week, and none of the servers are patched yet. Which of the following best describes this result? Is that an exploit, credentialed, zero-day attack, or false negative? And you have a choice of just looking at the, the version of what we're seeing. For example, the quick answer of 33 will tell you if it's just A, B, C, or D. But I also include what I call the details, which is a single page that documents everything you need to know about this question. So for this question, I you could, of course, go to page 70. We're on page 13 now. You could scroll, 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 scroll to page 70. But this is a PDF. So I've created links in the PDF where all I need to do is click the word right here, the details. And if I click it, it goes to page 70. Just immediately jumps forward to it. So the question is there at the top that asks about the vulnerability scan. And you can see that the answer on the screen is D, false negative. And I tell you, of course, why that is the correct response for this question. Now, when you're working with a practice exam, it's, of course, good to know that you got the question right. But when you get the question wrong, I believe it's actually more important that you understand why you got the question wrong. This could come up on your exam. So in my practice exams book, every incorrect answer is fully documented. So you know why I don't think that's the right answer for this particular question. So why wouldn't it be exploit? I explained to you why it would not be exploit. Would it be credentialed? I explained to you why it would not be credentialed. Would it be zero-day attack? I explained to you why this is not a zero-day attack. And if you've read the question and you really don't even understand the question, that is being asked, that's sort of a different kind of problem, that's OK. Because on the same page, I put a QR code and a link, a dynamic link, that will take you to the video that describes the content included with this particular question. So if you're really outside the scope and you don't know what the question is thinking about, you can jump to the video itself and we'll give you an overview of, in this case, vulnerability scans that comes from Objective 1.7 of the SY0601. And since this is a PDF in my PDF reader, I have a back button up here at the top. I can click my back button, and I'm back to where I started. And I can simply go to the next question on my list, and we can go through the same process again. Those are my practice exams. There are three full practice exams there. There are uh, 90 questions on each exam, and you have five performance-based questions on each of these exams for a total of 15 performance-based questions. It is a one-stop shop to be able to understand exactly what you should know and be ready for when you walk into that exam. It is my practice exams book. And as usual, if you get the physical version, you also get the downloadable digital version for free. So you can download it immediately while you're waiting for me to ship the book directly to you. That is the question and answer we were hoping to find for running that vulnerability scan. In that particular case, it is a false negative. Maybe that gives you some perspective, some of the things you should know if you're ever trying to finish up your studies and have an idea of what some of these technologies are. Those questions will certainly help you along the way. Now, if you're looking at some of these topics and you're wondering, where do these topics come from? Where do these, these numbering systems come from that I have in the topics? They are all from the CompTIA exam objectives. Everything listed in these objectives is potentially a question on your exam. 
they tend to stay very, very close to these objectives, almost exclusively. So that's why I often tell people, if you know every bullet in the exam objectives, then you're going to get this, this exam is going to be great for you. You're going to pass this exam, no problem. The exam objectives have everything you need to know. You can see I've even annotated my set with colors and things that I'm doing in mind. All of these bullets are there. And this is a free document directly from CompTIA. So have a look at professormesser.com slash objectives. There's a link that will take you over to the CompTIA website. Or you can simply go to your favorite search engine, type in CompTIA exam objectives. It will take you right to it. And you'll be able to answer or, or download that objectives document. This is a great checklist before you walk into your exam. It's an important checklist. Make sure you know everything that is in these objectives. Don't walk in and take your exam until you know every single one of these bullets. It's an important thing to study when you're planning to take your Security Plus exam. We do one of these Security Plus study groups every month. Our next Security Plus study group in November, can it be? We're already into November. November the 28th. November is an odd month here in the United States because we have to fit in Thanksgiving on the 23rd of November. So you can see I've sort of scrambled things around just a little bit in the chaos that is my schedule. A Plus is on the 7th and the 9th. We've got Network Plus on November the 21st and Security Plus on the 28th. But if you're watching this on a replay, and you're wondering, when is the next live event going to be that's well after November? You can always go to our calendar, professormesser.com slash calendar, and you will certainly be able to uh, know when the next live event is going to be. Lots to do there. And of course, we've always got something going on on our Discord. If you don't want to wait until November 28th, there's probably a Security Plus study group starting up generally in the evenings here in US time where somebody's in going through videos or looking at questions or simply asking each other topics from the exam. It's a great place to study over on our Discord. Don't forget about that one as well. That could be extremely useful if you're planning to take your exam before November the 28th. Maybe you need a last minute check of what you think you know. That's a great way to do it as well. Well, we have gone through an hour of Q&A. Can you believe it? But we've got more in the after show. You're going to ask me questions if you haven't posted them already. A lot I've seen coming through, and we will talk about some of these ideas. So this is one that you'll want to have a look in our after show of Q&A. Stick around for that one. Don't forget about our our weekly Security Plus pop quiz question at professormesser.com slash Twitter. We also have that same question over on Instagram at professormesser.com slash Instagram. And don't forget about our YouTube channel where all of our videos are available for you to watch absolutely free. Of course, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, get your discounted voucher at professormesser.com slash vouchers along with my Exam Hacks ebook. And of course, we have our Security Plus course notes and exam on our website. Go to professormesser.com slash securitycn, which stands for Security Course Notes. Well, thank you for being here in this first hour. Stick around. We're coming right back, and we'll be taking questions from you in our after show. We thank you so much for being here. We will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Oh, Bong. And there, I hit my mic with with my mug. I have my mug of everything here. And then you got the great kabong as I as I hit it as loud as I could. Okay. And there it is again. I gotta work on that. The it's good that it's working though. It wasn't my head. It was it was the drink. I gotta work on that one. You'd see it'd be a big mark on the head right there. Like something happened when I faded off into that next view. Okay, let's now have a look at uh, the questions that you have sent in. The way that we will do this, and I should have probably put this up on my screen as I was doing it because I can, can have it right there. You can, of course, submit questions for this study group at any time. There's a tab that is in your VBOX that allows for this. You can, of course, be able to do that. It's at vbox.app, and it's the same ID, 171-223-495, or you can use the QR code that is there on your screen. And you can submit questions. I'm going to go through the questions myself, and you'll, you'll be able to see exactly uh, the types of things that we'll be working on. So I'm going to sift through some of the questions that you have already put into this list, uh, and you'll happen to know it. For example, uh, let's put some questions up uh, to be able to do this. I think uh, we'll focus. I'm going to come back to the, kind of the, the popular questions in a moment. There's a few that have popped in that I think a number of people 
that have mentioned. But we're going to look at some of the questions that you have submitted. Let's start with one from Julian. Julian asks, thank you for all you do. What would you advise for someone who is taking the exam tomorrow morning? More cramming, chill out. What do you think? It's you chill out after the exam. Don't chill out before the exam. You have a lot to do on this exam. And I, I would bet, and there's always a chance, to be able to understand what topics may be covered on the exam. So I'm going to pull up the exam objectives just so we can give you a feel for this. This is what you should do before you take your exam. Ideally, you would have asked this question a week ago. But if we have a day, we'll, we'll take what we can get. So you've got a day to study. You've got a whole night to study. There's plenty of time to study. So in these exam objectives, we'll start with the very first domain. That's what they call these. 1.0 is threats, attacks, and vulnerabilities. And the subdomain 1.1 says, compare and contrast different types of social engineering techniques. For your studies, I want you to explain to yourself or to someone else, if they can tolerate it, what these different bullets mean. So if you look at phishing, you should know what phishing has to do with security, especially as it compares and contrasts against different types of social engineering techniques. So what about phishing? What about smishing? What about vishing? No, I'm not making these up. What about spam? What about spam over instant messaging or spim? What about spear phishing and dumpster diving? And show? you get the idea. You just go through every bullet. And if there's one where you just draw a blank, Circle it, make a note of it, write it down somewhere so that you can go back to that particular exam objective and read up on it and at least get some insight into that thing you were circling so you'll be ready for your exam tomorrow or next week or whenever it is that you're going to take that exam. I think the exam objectives are the, the best and probably the least used set of study materials that someone can go through. They are incredibly valuable. So even though they are available to download for free, they are priceless from the CompTIA website. Make sure that you get your hands on these exam objectives. That will be very, very important as you are working on this. Let's now talk more about the 601 and 701 exams. We'll start with a comment from Jonathan who asks, will you be doing 601-focused study groups with the 701 that is coming out? Well, I believe I will. Uh, the way this usually works is that there's this six-month or seven-month overlap between the time that a new exam is released and the time that the older exam is retired. So we have this overlap period. We also, if this is anything like what we have done in the past, what you will find is there will be limited study materials available for the 701 on launch day. We will have our course notes. We will have our videos. We will have a great deal of study materials available, and we'll continue to add to that as the months go on. But, of course, you will need to understand what topics you'll need to cover. You'll want there will be a group of people that will be starting with the 701, but it will be relatively small based on what people are already doing with the 601. So I tell people all the time that if you're already studying for the 601, keep studying for that one. Shifting gears in the middle, especially with the differences between these two exams, is going to cost you quite a bit of time. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, too. Um, that is the goal. And you can choose when you when you register for your exam, you choose which one you want to take. So this isn't random. It's not like you walk into the exam and it's a mystery as to which one you're getting. When you sign up to take your exam and you pick a date and a time, you choose which one you're taking. I want you to give me the 601 exam or I want you to give me the 701 exam. It's also very important you pick the right one. You don't want to be given the wrong exam. You'll be in trouble if something like that happens. And I do not want you to be in trouble. Uh, so to your question, though, about will I be doing 601 or 701 study groups for the time being, probably at least until the end of the year, we're going to continue doing 601. Because if, if it works the way it normally does, and we've been doing these courses since the 401 series. So this is our fourth series of Security Plus. What usually happens is it slowly starts getting a little momentum, slowly, slowly. But I think around the beginning of the year in January, 
is a good time for us to evaluate whether it's time to move to 701 type questions, especially since we already have three years of 601 questions in our video replays. So you can go back three years ago, all of those questions still apply. All of those questions are still valid for the 601 exam. So you have a great deal of content already in our library that you can pull from. So I don't feel so bad jumping to 701 at the beginning of the year because there's going to be a need for 701. And you've got a great deal of 601 materials to pull from. So that's not an enormous concern for what we are doing. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there are big differences between these two exams. So I wanted to bring up a spreadsheet that documents some of these differences, just so you can get a feel for what the differences are between the 601 exam and the 701 exam. And this is going to give you a little bit of, of inside baseball, just so you happen to know some of the things that we work on. Uh, this inside baseball is brought to you right here between the 601 and the 701 exam. So what I've done is I've written down the entire 701 exam objectives into this spreadsheet. And you can see it's colored because I use this spreadsheet when I'm creating my videos. So this is what I go through. So this is the way I know that I hit every objective on the exam because I'm going through every single one of them when I make my videos. And the thing that I also do is when I look at, for example, 1.1 on the 701 exam is compare and contrast various types of security controls. Sound familiar, right? For example, technical, managerial, operational, and physical. That's already different than the 601 exam. And in fact, I put in here on the 601, that's from section 5.1, section 5.1, section 5.1. And whoops, that one's new. That's really a note to me so that I know I have to create new content for these videos, prepare the information that I'm going to put into the video. And so every time you see yellow on this first column, that's new content. And as I scroll through, you see a lot of yellow, but you also see a lot of green. So the real question is, how much is yellow and how much is green? That's, of course, the information we need to know. Well, to find that out, I need to use the right keystrokes to go all the way to the end of this document. So we're going to go all the way down to the bottom. Maybe we will if I don't completely destroy everything that's here. We're going to go all the way to the bottom of all of these. You can see there are a lot of exam objectives where I've already counted them up. So the total number of 601 objectives, if you were to take the 601 exam right now, is just over 1,000. There are 1,000 things you need to know to pass your 601 exam. On the 701 exam objectives, that number is 662. That's a lot different than the 601 exam. There's much fewer objectives that you need to study on the 701 exam. Now, that in itself doesn't mean you should immediately jump to the 701. But it does mean that you need to consider what those differences might be, because that is a difference of 36% smaller. That's a significant difference in those two. So you may want to look at those two exam objectives to see which one is best choice for you, especially considering right now there are really no study materials available. The part that's interesting, and this is something that's also an important consideration, and the reason I tell you always study from materials that match the version of the exam you're planning to take, is that on the 601, uh, there are, on the 701, there are new objectives that did not appear on the 601. 338 of those 662 objectives are brand new and are not in any 601 book. They didn't write them because they weren't part of the exam objectives. That means 50%, technically 51.06 of the exam, brand new. More than half of the 701 exam is brand new. So think of it this way. If you were to study from 601 materials and you walked into a 701 exam, the best score you could get is a 49%, unless you guessed it some. But let's say that you stay strictly to the books. The best score you're going to get is 49%. And I will tell you, 49% is a failing score. You will not get your certification if you study for a 601 study materials and you walk into the 701 exam. And that's why it's so important, not just to me, but more important to you, that you really do look at the 7, 701 and 601 and pick the right one and study from the right materials. So pretty important. Yes, it is a third smaller and half of it is new. 
You're absolutely correct. You have, you have uh, encapsulated those statistics perfectly into this. So a lot less content, a lot of new, new material, and you need to know all of it. This, by the way, not unusual. This is pretty common when moving between one exam to another to another. It's, it's a normal update, but it's always important that we understand how we should study for these updates. I don't want you to be caught by surprise when you walk into an exam room. That is not what we want to do either. And from questions that you're putting in, you can still, still take the 601 exam until you uh, reach July 31st. So you have plenty of time as we sit here in October of 2023 to study for that 601 exam. Don't shift gears in the middle. You're effectively going to need to start over if you were to move from 601 and then suddenly want to take 701. So re really think about this. This could affect the amount of time it takes you to study for this certification exam. Make sure you choose correctly. And a question that came up in the chat room as we were talking about this is, does it matter to employers which one you take? And I've asked this question before every time we've had an update. And for the vast, vast, vast majority of people taking these exams, the employers don't care. They do not care. What they want is to see that you are Security Plus certified. And let me give you some perspective of why this doesn't matter. Uh, let's say you took Security Plus when it was the 401 exam. That's 10 years ago. So that 401 exam that you took, you became Security Plus certified. And let's say that every three years, you've renewed your certification. And even today, you continue to be Security Plus certified with a valid Security Plus certification that you have simply renewed over the last 10 years. That means that if somebody today walks in and takes the 601 and passes it, and they become Security Plus certified, they are just as Security Plus certified as the person who renewed four times. It's the same certification. In fact, it will be the same Security Plus as someone who takes the 701 on the first day and passes that exam. They are the same Security Plus certified as the person who took the 401 and renewed it over these years. So the, the version numbers that we're talking about are version numbers that are about the exam, not about the certification. So once you get certified, doesn't matter what they do with the test. doesn't matter what questions they're asking. You already passed. You never have to deal with those questions again, ideally. So that's why I tell people, don't worry so much about which one you're taking. Pick the one that's right for you. Pick the one where you have the study materials available and go study for that certification exam. That's the important one. So that's a, that is an important consideration. Um, and, and there are many different ways to renew your cert. Some people will take the newer exam as a way to renew. I don't think that's a very good way to renew your certification. That's the hardest way to renew right there. Most people will collect CEUs or perhaps more importantly or perhaps even easier is they will take the Cert Master CE to be able to renew. And that will be available for those folks on the 7th of November if you happen to earn your Security Plus certification by taking the 601 exam. So a lot of things you can do to renew. I have a video. It's in the YouTube video description of this video that it, it describes the different ways to renew your Security Plus certification. And in fact, the, the Cert Master CE is probably the easiest and the one that requires the least amount of time. There have been people that have come to me and said, I need to renew my certification. It expires tomorrow. And I've, I've said, you need to go download the Cert Master CE right now. Pay for it, download it, take it, submit it. And you can do that in about six hours, less than a day, and submit it and you're renewed. That's easy. You don't have to collect CEUs. You don't have to take a separate exam. You just pay for the Cert Master CE, complete those objectives, and submit it. And CompTIA says they'll probably take you around six hours to do something like that. Might take you longer. Might take you shorter. But I think that's a probably a pretty good number from their perspective. So hopefully that's giving you some perspective as to which exam version you take. These are important considerations and make sure you you choose right for you. Some people will want to move over to the 701, and I wish you the best of luck. Make sure you scramble around and try to find materials that are going to be able to work for you on day one for that 701 because it will take some time. But now that you know that, perhaps you can better prepare for that particular occasion. So let's talk about spoofing. Well, we've had a question 
on our study group today that talked about spoofing. And I talked about spoofing a MAC address. And Dennis says, well, if you can spoof a MAC address, could you also spoof an IPv6 address? Could you also spoof, I'll extend this, could you spoof an IPv4 address? Could you spoof an IPX address? <laughs> I'm, now, I'm now going well outside the scope. I've run out of layer three. Well, I don't have any more layer three left, so I went IPX. Um, yes, all of the term spoofing is simply uh, a shortcut or a slang that we use to describe changing a value to match something else, to pretend that you are someone else, to be a doppelganger, to be something that looks like that particular address. And all it really means is that we have administratively assigned that MAC address or administratively assigned an IP address. And as you know, you can type in an IP address right in Windows or Linux or Mac OS. You can manually put an address in. And if you put the same address as someone else, you are spoofing that address. Very easy to do with IP. Um, and IPv6, same thing. You could create and put your own address into that list. MAC address, the same way. So that's a good example of how spoofing is a, kind of a generic term, and we sort of apply that term across many different layers. What we're really saying is, can you pretend to be someone else? Yes, you can. And you can do that with MAC addresses, IPv6 addresses, IPv4 addresses, and very much the same. Uh, along the lines of our study groups, uh, we mentioned uh, when that Security Plus 701 is kind of a follow-up to the one we had before, what will be the format of these study groups? Will it be a combination of the 601 and 701? It will not. It will be, when we make the move, it will be a 701. So you will notice that in the, uh, in the objectives and the information that we send out about these study groups, that currently just has Security Plus. But when we make the move, it will have a version number on it so you know we've moved to the 701 version of the Security Plus, just so everyone knows what this is about. So next month will probably be a 601 study group again, and it will say in the title, this is a 601 study group. Uh, what I tend to do when we move into the 701s is I have a combination of things that are new, and occasionally I'll bring in things that are the same between the two exams, and we'll mention which ones are there. But the, the 601 and 701 exams are so different that it's hard to make a single study group or even have multiple study groups, which would just be a little overwhelming. So I tell people all the time, we will simply make the move. It will say in the title of the study group, this is the 601 or this is the 701. So you'll know what type of study group there will be and what the, the numbers are and what the, the content is that we will be focusing on on those study groups. Uh, some folks in the chat room said, can you give us that spreadsheet showing the differences between the 601 and 701? I cannot. I cannot. Unfortunately, that everything that's in there, and you didn't even get to see some of it, is all proprietary information. So I don't have that. But you can make your own. It, it's not too difficult to put all these things together. So the 601 exam objectives and the 701 exam objectives are available on the CompTIA website, and you can put them side by side and compare them yourself. Uh, there, it should be relatively easy to do that cross-tabulation between both of those. Let's see uh, other questions that you have submitted, because we do have some plenty of time left. So I feel like I'm rushing through, but we don't have to. As usual, you can submit those questions on the, the VVox front end, the VVox.app, the ID is 171-223-495. As you see on your screen, you can submit those questions in your VVox front end that's in your browser. And I'm just going through all of those, kind of stepping through as we, as we break these out. Uh, let's bring this over here. Okay, more questions um, and other things that are here. Um, I think we've, we've, some of these are duplicated, so we will we'll talk about this in a moment. Here is a, I would say, a frequently asked question. Some people don't like my answer to this one, which is fine. It's perfectly reasonable. And I think I'll, I'll explain and give you some context, too. The question asks, Professor Messer, this is from Sammy, who asks, Professor Messer, do we need to know a lot of port numbers for Security Plus? Well, this is a good question. I think what we should do is go to the arbiter of everything that is on the exam, which would be our Security Plus exam objectives. If I've already mentioned to you, not only does CompTIA stay very close to these objectives, they almost exclusively stay with these objectives. And this is something that I've heard other educators or other training 
professionals, uh, quote unquote, in this field will tell people, no, they could ask you anything. Well, that's true. They could, but they do not. They stick to these objectives almost exclusively, which means that if you know every bullet that's in these exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. That's really what this means. But let's look through these exam objectives, and let's pull out every port number listed in the objective. So here's section one. Um, OK, there's no port numbers on that page. Let's go to the next two pages. We'll grab the port num um, Nope. No. OK, there's no, no port numbers there. Let's go to the next two pages. No, there's no port numbers there. OK, next two. We're already up to middle of section two, end of section two. No port numbers there. No port numbers in section three. No port numbers in section four. No port numbers in section five. No port numbers at all in the exam objectives. So what I often tell people, and this has happened before, is they've shown up on my website or they've shown up in a, um, in a, a study group like this, and they've got an enormous page of 50 port numbers that they're memorizing. And they're saying, I've, I've spent time and I've memorized all 50 of these. And I say, that's great. How many of those are in the exam objectives again? And they look and they go, there's none. There's, there's zero. There's zero, no port numbers in the exam objectives. Now, that is an important consideration when you're trying to determine what should I study for my exam. Should I study something that's not even listed in the exam objectives? Or should I spend my time studying things that I know could show up on the exam? You have to make that decision. But I will also tell you that there are topics that are a little bit in scope that you may not realize. For example, in this Security Plus exam, see if I can get to the right page of this. Here we go. Uh, let's go to, not that one. Did I just close it? Great. There's. Let's go to our exam objectives. Here we go. And I'm going to have a look at a comment they make on the objectives at the very beginning of the file. And I think this is an important consideration, too, especially if you are someone who is trying to determine where do I start my studies. And this is on the front page of the objectives for the 601. Uh, it's 90 minutes long. And they say your recommended experience for taking this exam is at least two years of work experience in IT systems administration with a focus on security. So that's where they're, that's the baseline. That's where they're assuming you have two years of experience that we're just going to assume you know what a network is. We're going to assume you know what a protocol is. And we're going to assume that you know a handful of what the most popular port numbers are. And so this is my sort of my official stance is if it's not in the exam objectives, don't worry about it. But I will tell you, with two years of work experience, there will be port numbers you run across. The most number of port numbers you should probably study for this exam is maybe five of them, if you wanted to. And I don't recommend you do, because you sort of know these already. What port numbers used by a web browser? Well, port 80 and port 443. OK. What port numbers are used by SSH? Port 22. What port number is used by, so there's these, these top five or so that you can think about. That's about as far as I would go with it. If it's not listed in the exam objectives, don't spend any significant time on it. That's definitely not what you want to do. You want to instead really focus on getting into what you need to know for the exam, going to the objectives and dealing with them. Now, somebody will ultimately tell me, but wait, there may be questions on the exam that want me to know port numbers. There very well might be. It'd be kind of unusual for there to be a lot of those since none of them are listed in the exam objectives. But I would say for the purposes of your study time, a much better way to spend your time is to study the things that you know could be asked of you on the exam. And those would be the things that are listed in your exam objectives. So that's what I would recommend to you is that you focus on those single objectives. I think that is really the important part of this. Don't worry so much about port numbers. Focus instead on what is going to be important for you to know from the exam objectives. You'll probably be able to spend more time studying something you might actually be asked rather than studying something that is completely undefined and people are studying a page of 50 of them. So that's, that's the real interesting issue of this and breaking those out. Um, 
Uh, question in here, since we're talking about time frames, I sort of spoke to this a little bit, but I'll talk about me anyway. Uh, from Ivan, who asks, when will, mater when will materials for a new version of Security Plus be available? So the 701 exam in this case. How not to miss deadlines and not prepare for the wrong version? How different are they? Well, we've already answered how different they are. Uh, but the real question is, when will these materials be available? So on November 7th is when the SY0701 exam will finally be available to take in testing centers. And that will be the day that CompTIA releases all their book. They release their, uh, their labs. They release their practice tests. They release everything that they're, they're creating content on. They will release all of that on that November 7th day. So all of the CompTIA products will be available on that day. Other third-party publishers like myself have to decide ourselves when we will be publishing our content. Uh, my course notes will be available on the 7th, maybe before. I might have a little bit of time before that to make them available, but they'll certainly be available on the 7th as well. A big chunk of my videos will be uploaded and available for you to watch. Hours of that will be available on the very first day. And there'll probably be more of those that are rolled out over the coming weeks after that. Uh, the, the other piece that we tend to create is our success bundle. That includes our practice exams. Those practice exams will probably be updated and available around the beginning of the year time frame, I think, maybe, could be before, could be after. We don't have a solid date on any of these. They're, they're effectively, I work on them, and when they are available, I make them available to you. So there is no, there's no deadline. I'm not pushing to get it done in a particular time frame as a, as a, a matter of rule, as, a, as something that we do here. So I don't think creating an arbitrary date and somehow pushing to meet an arbitrary date equals quality. I think that we should create quality content, make sure that content is ready for you and that it applies to the latest exam. And without the arbitrary date and the pressure of trying to get something out just to get it out, I would prefer making it available to you when it is really ready to be available to you. So uh, practice exams will probably be available, you know, month or two after that November 7th release. So somewhere around the end of the year, beginning of next, somewhere in there is the plan. Uh, will that be different than what I'm thinking in my head? Probably. It'll probably be very different, but just ask. You can always ask and say, when are these things coming? And we'll get them there eventually. You'll you'll be able to work through those and, and be able to understand the differences between all of them. And I'll, I'll be able to give you more information on dates as I'm working on it. And I have a better idea of when those are out. But effectively, they will be available when they are completed, and I will put them online, and you'll be able to have access to those. If you purchase the success bundle before these materials are available, they'll simply be added to your success bundle when they are released to everyone else. So you lose nothing. You are always, my success bundle owners get everything. So I include that, of course, in there as well. Not a, not a big deal, and we'll make sure you have that. Um, other questions. Let's keep going through this list. You guys have some great questions in here, by the way. Um, so this is this is a pretty good question. This sort of applies both to the 601 and the 701 exam. And it's a good question from Jared who asks, how many hours, in your opinion, would the average student need to write the exam in December? Already been through your videos once in and out of an SY0601 book. So there's a couple of questions in here, and your question sort of uh, has some conflict in it. How many hours, and then I need to do this in December. Well, that's that's about how many you would need then. You would need however many hours it is until when you need to write this in December. So you have a deadline, apparently. Uh, that's how long it's going to take you. That's how long you get. So not really a choice. However, I will tell you on average, this tends to be a process that takes two to three months for people. So from the time they start studying for their Security Plus exam until the time they take their exam and pass it, it is on average two to three months. That means it could be fewer than three months, two to three months. It could be longer than two to three months. But on average, that's probably about right to what people are doing. And considering that we're in the end of October, November, December, that's two months, completely possible to do this. And of course, this time frame changes based on how much you already know. So if you've been working in the industry for years, you're already familiar with a lot of these terms, you're already part of a security team, it might make, take you a week 
to study everything you need to know. But if you've never touched this content before, it's probably going to take you closer to three months. It might take you fewer than three months if you study a little bit more, you're a little more aggressive. But as you're thinking about this from a perspective of doing this in December, I would highly recommend that you look at the exam objectives, use those as your checklist, and be able to track this over time. So if, let's say you study for a week, see how far you get into the exam objectives. And from there, you can extrapolate Based on what I've done so far, how long is this going to take? And you'll be able to make that decision. And you can decide, maybe I should put a couple of extra hours in every day. Or maybe I'm right on track to meet that December date. You can decide. Everybody's a little bit different in the process that they use, in the amount of time that it takes, and the knowledge that they have. So not everybody is the same. And I think that uh, you'll be able to figure it out once you start your studies as to exactly how long it will take for you. Everyone, of course, a little bit different. So let's keep going through this list of questions and where we would focus on these. Uh, you may have even seen this, and I, I wanted to mention this. Trey asks, I came across a post that listed 344 acronyms associated with the 601. How stressed out should I be about memorizing all of these acronyms? I don't want it to needlessly eat away at my study time. And that's that's a Good consideration. I would not want this to eat away at your study time either. So for this question, we go back to our exam objectives. Of course it is. So on our exam objectives, I'm going to scroll through the first domain, the second domain, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And in the back of the exam objectives is the Security Plus SY0601 acronym list. Here are all of the acronyms or a large percentage of them are acronyms that are covered as part of the exam objectives themselves. And there are four pages of these. So there's quite a few that are in this list. Some of these are from the exam objectives directly. Most of these are. Some of these aren't covered in the exam objectives, and they stick them in here. I don't know why. I'm not sure why they put them in here. But they, there they are nonetheless. They're, they're not as well vetted in these exam objectives. The acronyms are not as well vetted as the rest of the objectives. And what I tell people, and I think this is probably pretty accurate, is that this list you are going to learn organically as you go through the exam objectives. For example, we'll start with the very top here. Things like AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Well, there's a AAA section in the exam objectives, and you'll learn what that is. You'll notice in my videos that whenever I use an abbreviation for the first time, I always spell it out. So that I, I, I say that I do that for you. I really do, really do that for me. I can't remember all these different acronyms. We don't even use these terms when we're in meetings with folks. We talk about the AAA server. Uh, do you guys have a AAA server? What, what type of AAA server is it? Is it Radius? Is it LDAP? Are you doing Kerberos on your AAA server? We almost forget there's words associated with AAA. But we never seem to say, oh, do you have an authentication, authorization, and accounting server? And what type is it? We never say it like that. We always just ask, do you have a AAA server? So even security professionals that have been doing this in the field and that have been working through understanding and communicating with all of these very detailed and very technical topics, we can't even remember what all of these are. Now, that... That's sort of sad to say it that way. We, after a while, you do remember and you start to use it that way. We just don't use those terms when we're communicating with people every day. So we may have to take a second and go, oh, wait, AAA, that's right. Authentication, authorization, accounting. Okay, got it. Um, so you're going to learn most of these as part of what you're doing with your studies. Don't worry so much about the abbreviation of these. I will give you a hint, however. So let's let's look at this list. You will not get a question on your exam like this. You will never see a question on your exam that says, what does AAA stand for? You will never get a question like this. So if you're spending a lot of time trying to memorize AAA is authentication, authorization, accounting. ABAC is attribute-based access control. ACL is access control. If you spend all of your time doing this, you are wasting it an enormous waste of time. If you want to properly study the objectives, here's what you should study. AAA stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. And here's how it can be used 
to secure your systems. You need to add that part on to the end, which means there's a paragraph of information that you need to memorize. AAA servers could be radio that's commonly used for authentication, checking a username and password. Once someone logs in, what are they authorized to visit? It's everything is logged. That's where the accounting comes from. It could be running the Radius protocol, the LDAP protocol, the uh, Kerberos, and that's what people will have to be able to centralize the authentication to switches, to routers, to firewalls, to VPNs, and other authentication requirements in their environment. That's AAA. That's what you should have on your flashcard. That's what you should be memorizing. Don't just memorize AAA means this because you will never get a question like that on your exam. Never, never. Instead, what they tend to do on the exam, and you noticed this today for sure, is they will ask a question, and in the question, they will use these abbreviations, or in the answers, it will be a bunch of answers that are abbreviations. So if you don't know what those abbreviations are and how they are used, you will never be able to answer these questions. So there is a value to knowing what those abbreviations stand for in some cases. For example, if we look at AP means access point. Well, I know what an access point is. So if you know those two things, you may be able to derive what that is based on what those words are. So it's not that memorizing these words is pointless. There is some point to it until you get to other things like DHE is Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. That, that doesn't help me. Knowing that that is the names associated with that abbreviation doesn't provide you with any answers. So you have to take the next step. Diffie-Hellman ephemeral is this key exchange algorithm that is used on a temporary basis. And you can even go into details of where you would use this on a web server, how it's built into your browsers. You can keep going with this. So that's what I highly recommend that you do when it comes to acronyms is not just know the acronym, but know how to use this technology on your network. Know how to implement this te technology as part of your security. So pretty important. Make sure you understand those differences, and, and you'll do fine on the exam. The acronyms are not going to be a big problem for you. And I think you'll know most of them just organically as you go through the study materials. I think that's, that's about right. Um, other questions. Uh, Mike asks, and this is a, another common question. It's a good one to go through. Mike asks, since the passing score is 750 on a scale from 100 to 900, does this equate to about an 81% correct answer? I don't know. I, I have no idea how CompTIA scores their exams. What we do know is that each question is worth a different number of points. And because of that, Building out a percentage is inaccurate and relatively pointless. There's no way to create a, a percentage when every question is worth a different number of points. All we know is there is 750 you need to score out of a total between 100 and 900. So is it really 650 that we need to score out of the 900? <laughs> This is out of an 800. So 650 out of 800 is about 81%. But we know that the questions themselves are worth a number of different number of points. So we can't use that as a measuring stick. We can't be in the exam looking at what we've answered and think, well, I know 80% of these I've got solid. And that's if I get any one of the extra questions right, I've passed this exam. That's not necessarily true. That's not that's not even close to being true because we have no idea how many points the different questions are worth. And there's no way to tell. And here's the thing, you will never know. That's right. CompTIA will never tell you how these exams are scored. You will never be able to reverse engineer your score out of your exam object out of your exam results. There's just no way. And so it's, it's an interesting process. It's an interesting thought process. We're always min-maxing, right? We're always trying to get the best possible score. We're always trying to figure out where's the line that we have to get over to pass this exam. Perfectly reasonable to consider that, by the way, Mike. The problem is that you have no idea how this could be possibly scored. There's no way to know how it's scored. 
And so you can't really base it on a number of questions or a percentage of questions. Ultimately, it's kind of a waste of time to do that because you will never know. CompTIA will never tell you. And so don't worry so much about the score. In fact, I would recommend you don't worry at all about the score. The score is going to take care of itself. The score is going to show up at the end, and it's either going to be a passing score or not a passing score. And there's really nothing you can do to change that. So I think that's really the, the real focus here is going down the line of understanding what these are. Um, so uh, let's, here's one that's really, this is more of a personal question, but I think it's worth talking about. Uh, I don't mind personal questions. Yes, I do. This question asks, I don't mind this one. Dennis asks, Professor, what special technique do you use to study? Because you know so many things. Well, my special technique was I worked in the industry for 25, 30 years. I did this in the field. And I, in, in many ways, I think this is what differentiates our training materials from anything else you will find is I've already been a cybersecurity engineer. I've already worked with security on the biggest networks in the world. I've already visited around the world some of the biggest data centers that you will ever step into. And I have been on the forefront of security technologies for a very long time in this industry. And I've taken all of that knowledge that I learned by visiting thousands of customers around the world, looking at every one of these networks, understanding the security that is used on the biggest networks in the world and the smallest networks in the world. And I'm applying that to these training materials. Somebody gave me a very, they don't think they realized it. They gave me uh, quite a compliment the other day because they said, the questions that you write tend to be very real world. They tend to have the right answers that focus on what people are really doing on their networks. And I, I don't think that person sort of understood where I where my background was, but that's why these questions are written that way. Because the things that I'm giving you in the questions are the things I saw people doing with these technologies. These are the technologies that I implemented. I connected to AAA servers. I uh, sent information via syslog to SIMS. I configured next generation firewalls. I defined layer three routing with dynamic routing protocols. All of these things we're talking about in these courses helps if you have some context. And what I'm hoping to bring to the table when I do these courses is to provide you with that context. This is what people are doing with these technologies. This is how people are using these technologies. These are the technologies that work the best. These are the things that we have seen on a network when people use these technologies. That's the type of thing that I think is important when you're learning, when you have no understanding of how the world connects these devices together, how they use them, bringing an approach where I can tell you, here's how people are using them. So when you drive downtown and you see that enormous building of that multi-billion dollar company, I want to tell you, here's how that multi-billion dollar company is implementing syslog. Here's how they put in next generation firewalls. Here's why they've decided on redundancy and fault tolerance and how they've implemented it in those networks. Those are important considerations. And I think whenever you're trying to get this very complex and varied amount of topics surrounding security and networking and even the A plus and understanding the fundamentals of technology, it helps if you have somebody that's done it before and can take you through that particular piece of it. So if I had to, I wouldn't call it a special technique, but I would say that everything is grounded in real world use. And that's why you don't see me making training courses on programming. I'm not a programmer. I don't, I've never worked professionally. Well, that's not true. I have, I've worked professionally as a programmer. When I, I had a company previously where I wrote my own software many, many years ago. And it was so good that I no longer do it anymore. So I'll, I'll just say that. There's a reason we don't talk about programming um, and do that. Instead, why don't we focus on things I do know about? And so if it's in my, if it's in my wheelhouse, we can talk about it. And A plus network plus security plus and perhaps other things that may come down the line will always be focused on a real world approach because I think that is the best approach when you're trying to learn these topics. So that is my special technique. Um, now, if we get into studying, let's, I've studied for a lot of different industry certifications. 
Um, and one of the things that I do is I surround myself with as many different study materials as possible and different types of media. So I want a good book. I want to go through some videos. I want to do some labs. I want to do some Q&A. And that you'll notice in my courses that a lot of the things you can get from my courses are videos and books and labs and Q&A. And because those are the things that I think help me the most. And I think anytime you're trying to study for one of these exams, it's stressful enough as it is. Let's get you study materials that have been specifically and exclusively designed for the course that you're trying to take. So everything that's in my courses is very specific to the version that you're taking. You will never see anything that's out of date in my study materials because that's not going to help you pass your exam. So anytime you're studying, get as many different types of study materials as possible. And I think you'll be okay. That's, that is the idea and the focus there. And I think that's, that's a good way to approach it too. Is not just any one thing, it's a combination of things. Sort of like anything else in life. As it, as it turns out, uh, and the way that it works there. Uh, other questions, um, let's keep going uh, and be able to break through some of these others. We're at the top of the hour, but I want to get through at least another question here and be able to uh, kind of focus on other topics that are in this list. Um, so the um, there is a question here. This is more of a product question. I think it's worth mentioning since I've talked about these from Mason. who says, if we purchase the digital version of my course notes, are you able to print them? Yes, you are. So the unlike other PDFs that you will find, if you purchase my course notes and they're delivered as a PDF, they're a PDF that you can put on all of your machines that you travel around with as long as you're the only one using those course, course notes. And you could print them if you wanted to. Of course, I do have the option to have a, a per, they call it perfect bound. It's that, uh, that paperback binding for the course notes and print them in color and just ship them right out to you. That's another option you may want to consider. But you could do this yourself if you wanted to. Probably cost you a little bit more than if I do it, but that's up to you. Maybe you only need a couple of pages out of it. You can absolutely do that. You can print them. Uh, I did not want to create study materials that were intentionally locked or were limited in how you were able to use them. I don't think that does you a service. And ultimately, if we can talk from a perspective of cybersecurity, you can apply any type of control that you would like to a PDF or any other type of security uh, that you would put on, on any type of training material. There's a way to get around it. There's always a way to get around whatever barriers someone puts in place. So I decided instead of creating a training material that was more difficult for you to use because some other ne'er-do-well wanted to copy it, that doesn't make sense. Why don't we just go ahead and make it easy for you to use because the ne'er-do-wells are going to copy it anyway. Now, I don't like it when they copy it. And if I see it online, I submit a copyright takedown and we are able to remove those from the internet. But I have found that the people who are studying for this certification are very good about copyright and purchasing products that are valuable. And I think that's a difference is if this wasn't valuable, you wouldn't buy it. So I have to make sure these are high quality because there's a reason that, that I'm asking you to be able to spend money on this. It needs to be something worth spending money on. So that is uh, another consideration. And I, that's why I tell people, yeah, print it out. If you need to print out, go print it um, and do that. That's something you should have complete control over the things that you own. Um, and that's a good reason for that. Uh, other questions uh, on this is this one right here. And this question asks, um, the one that's here, do I have one? There we go. Uh, Nelson asks, will you know right away if you pass or fail the exam? Will you? Um, yes, you will. Well, sort of right away. Here's, here's what they do, just so you're aware. So you take the exam. You go through the entire thing. They give you a summary screen at the end that shows you all of the questions and what you answered on all of the questions. It tells you if you didn't answer a question. It tells you if there's certain questions that you flagged that you might want to go back and look at again, and you can do that at the end. But there's one final screen that is sort of a summary of here's everything you answered. And then you can submit your exam. And uh, it says, okay, this will end your exam. You can't go back and change anything at this point. This is the final version of your answers. 
If that's the case, click yes, and we will score it. You see, you will click yes. It says, before we show you the whether you passed or failed, let's get some information from you. And they go through an entire demographic survey that you have to answer before you know if you pass the exam or not. So I don't necessarily agree or disagree with that. But if you're not ready for it, it can be a little unnerving. Like, wait, I just said, yes, I want to see my score. And now it's asking me, how old are you? Where do you live? What is this? What is that? Could you just give me the, can we get through? It's already stressful enough. Um, and so you have to go through the demographic questions. And then finally, once you answer the last demographic question, it will then tell you whether you passed or failed right there. Immediately, you will be able to go online onto your CompTIA account, and it will show you in the account whether you passed or failed, and it will give you the page, the printout, if you will, the PDF that describes what you got right or really what you got wrong. It doesn't tell you what you got right, but it does tell you what you got wrong. It doesn't tell you the questions you got wrong. It tells you the subdomain numbers from those exam objectives that were associated with the topics that you got wrong. Um, so limited in what it provides you, but it does provide you with some details which are there. But you know effectively in the room before you leave whether you passed or whether you failed, which is, it's nice. It's nice to be able to know that. You don't have to wait. There's not something afterwards. There's not uh, other things you have to go through. You don't find out a, a month later. It's not like you're waiting on your SATs to show up uh, online and figure out what your score is. You know immediately whether you passed or failed, which is good. Um, and if you passed, great. You can leave and you're good. If you failed, I really recommend when you walk outside the testing center immediately in your car or take a seat if you're, you're traveling some other way, write down everything you can remember from the exam. You obviously can't share that information with others, but you can, of course, remember immediately. The longer you wait, if you were to drive home and try to do it then, you've already forgotten things. So write it down right there outside the testing center. And that's going to be important if you are someone who is really focusing on taking this exam again and passing it, write down everything you can, you know, make a note, make a voice note of it, do something that's capturing those details. Oh, I think I got this wrong. There was a topic about this. They wanted me to do this thing. One of the performance based questions was this, you know, you can, you can get all of that. And, and yes, you'll be, you'll be crying. I did fail my exam. Let me write this down. Okay. Well, through the tears, write down everything you can. I think that'll be the important part. You could tell I'm just a bad, I'm an awful crier. So, yeah, that's that's not a good situation. Maybe somebody will stop by. Are you okay? Is everything hard? Yeah, I just failed an exam. It's awful. But write down everything you can. Through through the, the agony and the tears, write down everything you can. It will help you, of course, when it's time to take this exam again. And you will take the exam again, and you will pass it. So, as I tell people all the time, you don't really fail unless you don't take the exam again. That's when you fail is you quit. So you're going to take the exam again. So you haven't failed yet. You just need to take the exam again. That's that's the important part of it. Um, another question real quick. Um, so this is this is more of a this is really the question. So can I comment on the 601701 and which I felt was better? This is the subject the subjective question of the day. This, this is absolutely my opinion. You suggested we asked this earlier. You're right, I did. So let's talk about this. I think this is probably a good way to, to finish up what we were doing today. So the 601 is a big exam. In fact, three and a half years ago when that 601 came out, so effectively four years ago when we started working on the 601, one of the things I noticed was that this is huge. I mean, it's what, 177 videos? On, on the website, it's a lot of videos, more than any other course, 177. And one of the things I was thinking at the time is, this is really a large exam. The 601 is enormous. It asks technical questions. It asks processes and procedures. You have to know command lines. You have to understand all of these different security frameworks. You have to know information about encryption and cryptography. You, it's huge. It's a big certification course. And I thought at that time, this is just too, it's really big. 
So, oh, by the way, all of you that have passed your 601 exam, I'm, I'm giving you the applause right now. Nice job of going through that entire exam and earning your certification. You have been through the one of the most strenuous and one of the biggest exams that CompTIA has ever created, and you passed it. So congratulations, well done. The 701, I will describe as right-sized. So the 701 was a very different uh, experience. Somebody in the chat room saying, was 501 really that smaller? What a good question. So let's go even farther back than this is. And let's look at my sheet where I compared the objectives from the 501 exam. And as this should not be too surprising, I have a spreadsheet for that as well. 501 to 601. Of course I do. Same thing. Same process. I got it down to a science at this point. So let's have a look at the statistics when we went from the 501 to the 601. And let's see what they are. So on the 501 exam, this is going to, you're going to think this is crazy. The, the 601, the 501 exam had 778 objectives. That's almost like the 701. And the 601 has 1,038 objectives, which we know. And on that 601 exam, 51% of the exam objectives were new. How do you like that? How do you? It's almost identical. We've now, we went to the 601 where it blew up. And now we've effectively gone back to the size of the 501. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah, the 701 and the 501 are very similar in their size and being able to work through it. So, yeah, that's that's pretty spot on to what we were seeing. So on this one, I started putting together the 701 course, and I thought, this is a lot smaller. So on the 601 exam, it was 177 videos. On the 701 exam, it's 121 videos. So already you're starting to see that difference. It is smaller. There are fewer number of videos because there's a fewer, there's there's less content. I will certainly get people complaining. This happens all the time that, wait, you made a 601 exam. It was 177 videos. Now you've cheapened out and only made 121 for the 701. What happened? Or did you get tired? Are you just don't want to do it? <laughs> like, no, the 701 is a smaller exam. Uh, and by the way, 121 videos is a lot of videos. That's that's a lot of stuff. Um, so it's it's now down. It's now what I'd like to say. The 701 has been right sized. It's now a properly sized certification exam when you compare it to all the other ones that CompTIA has. And I think that's that's important. I'm glad they did that. I'm glad they make that made that change. But the information that's on 601 is still valid. The certificate, the the cryptography we use that talk about in the 601 is still the cryptography we use today. The frameworks that are listed on the 601 are still the frameworks that we use today. Security plus security content doesn't change that quickly. Being able to, to know how to protect a network is the same concept that it was three years ago. So 601, just because the 701 is smaller, doesn't mean the 601 content is any less applicable to today's technologies because it absolutely is. So I think that's the important part is focusing on what you need to take to earn your certification as quickly as possible. Maybe that's the 601, maybe that's the 701, but they're two very different exams and you have to choose the one that's right for you with what you're trying to do, the objectives you're trying to accomplish, the timeframes you have in mind, make sure you keep all those things into account and grab the 601 and 701, see which one makes sense for you. I think that's an important consideration, especially when you consider what's there. Now, people in the chat room are saying, well, did they did they get rid of things or did they simply just make them smaller number of things? Well, in some cases, they got rid of them completely. So, for example, I gave you an example of, of the all of the command lines you have to know. So on the 601 exam, I'm going to go back to the exam objectives. This is a really good example of this. Um, so on the 601 exam objectives, there is a big section in section four. Let's bring this up so you can see it. This is uh, given a scenario, use the appropriate tool to access, to assess organizational security. 
So this is trace route, NS lookup, IP config, in map ping, H ping, netstat, netcat, IP scanners, ARP route, curl, the harvester, sniper, scanless, DNS, enum, Nessus, cuckoo, head tail, cat, jep, uh, cat, grep, ch mod, logger, SSH, PowerShell, Python, open SSL, TCP relay, TCP dump, Fireshark, DD, mem dump, winhex, FTK imager, and autopsy. That's what's on the 601 exam. On the 701 exam is none of that. None of those are on the 701 exam. So they have, in many cases, completely removed entire sections of the 601. Otherwise, you'd never be able to decrease the size by 30%. Now, others, they have greatly limited how much information is there. But uh, another example of this is, and some of these changes are quite good, by the way, uh, so another one that was brought up, let me see if I can remember uh, which section of the exam this is. So in section 3.4, you have to know authentication protocols. So you've probably studied EAP, PEEP, EAPFAST, EAPTLS, EAPTTLS, and there's even 802.1x uh, and RADIUS in this list as well. Well, a lot of people spend a lot of time. What's the difference between EAP, PEEP, EAPFAST, EAPTLS, and EAPTTLS? Well, the reality is on today's networks, we just use EAP. And there's some variants of that you might choose in there. So on the 601 exam, you have all of those four different authentication protocols you have to know. On the 701 exam, you just have to know EAP, EAP, and what it is. That's it. So there is a great deal that has been left out. Some of it is completely removed. Some of it is simply pared down. So it really depends on what you're doing and what the differences are on the 601 versus the 701. I think there is there there are good parts on the 601 and good parts on the 701. Some of it they took out of the 601. I'm kind of sad to see. I like doing the command line. I like demonstrating those. I like showing how to use these at the command line. I think it's better. But now CompTIA has these three different Security Plus certification exams. They have Security Plus, they have CISA Plus, they have CASP. And I think they've change the name of one of them, right? They're changing the names of some of them. Security X. So there's there's different flavors of security exams, and they can take some that was in 601 and put it over there and make this exam more reasonable as an entry-level security certification that gets you more familiar with the terms, the nomenclature, allow you to sit in the room with technical people and have a conversation, but not necessarily know how to run a grep. We'll, we'll get to that. That will be an important skill that you learn in the CISA Plus. But for the 701 exam, let's focus on the fundamentals. And I think they did an exceptional job of focusing you on the fundamentals. And that's where you need to start if you're within security, is you need to know these terms. You need to know how we use these technologies. We'll get to the command line eventually. We will get there. But security is a very broad perspective, a very broad consideration uh, uh, the entire industry of security has has such a huge scope that we really do need to break these out and right-size the certifications. And I think 701 was probably a good step towards that and being able to work this. Along those same lines, people are saying, I bought a voucher this month. I was planning to take the 601. Does that mean I can only take the 601? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Security Plus voucher can be used for any Security Plus exam as long as you have not scheduled your exam yet and used the voucher, you can take any exam you want in Security Plus. And that's the difference. When you, when you schedule an exam, you redeem the voucher. You hand it in. You put it in to pay for your exam. And as soon as you pay for your exam, the voucher is no good anymore. You've already paid for your exam and you've locked in an exam version. So if you have bought a voucher this month, and you're thinking, I was going to take the 601. Now I'm going to take the 701. Well, it's fine. You can still use that same voucher to take the 701 when it's available. As long as you haven't already used the voucher. As long as the voucher is still valid. And you have to check the dates on the voucher. That's an important thing. Is your vouchers are commonly good for about a year. And you have to take either of these exams. You must take the exam before the voucher expiration date. That's an important thing. May not That's not entirely clear from the date. It seems like the voucher expires in a year, so I have to use the voucher in a year. No, it's more than that. You have to not only use the voucher, but take the exam before that year is up. 
So that's an important consideration. And on my website, the vouchers that I have, unfortunately, are only, I say unfortunately for the rest of you in the world, are only available and usable if you are in North America, Canada, really it's it's United States, Canada, and some U.S. territories, and, and all the U.S. territories. That's the difference. Um, unfortunately, I don't have vouchers available for other parts of the world, at least not yet. Um, it's There's a challenge associated with that. And unfortunately, I just don't have any on my site for that. But that's... That's a good question and one that we have not yet been able to address. There are many challenges associated with revenue recognition and being able to convert between different currencies and, well, I guess until, until Bitcoin becomes the number one way to buy things on the internet, uh, we still have to deal with that type of thing. The fiat is uh, the fiat. We have to work through the challenges associated with buying and transferring monies between different countries, which, as it turns out, is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, we'll figure that. Ultimately, we'll figure out eventually what we can do with those. All right. Uh, and if I go back to the questions, uh, I might be able to fit one more in here, which would be really, really great if I was able to do that. Uh, and this is a good question. Since, uh, since am I going to use that fireplace back here? It's just been sitting there. Every time you see this fireplace, there's nothing going on. It is a real fireplace. It does work. It's amazing. Uh, it's, a, it's a gas fireplace. I just turn it on when it gets cold. But we, our headquarters, obviously, um, is in Florida. It's not a green screen. I wish I had something to throw at the screen. It's not a green screen. Bong. Uh, it's not cold today. It's like 80 degrees outside because I'm in Florida. So, indeed, in Florida, we do have fireplaces. Uh, it does get cold maybe a day or two out of the year. So on those days, that will happen. But it's not a it's not a green screen. That's that's real. Well, you probably didn't even see that because it was left-handed. Uh, not my primary. But that's uh, the, I do use it. It is it is legit. That is a real, that's my room. That's that's the studio. There's a real room. It's not a green screen. There's real stuff there. I move it around every once in a while. Uh, or do I? Or do I simply change the green screen around to make it look like it's not a green screen? Huh? We don't know. It could be either one of those. We're not sure. Um, I am looking to change out the background, though, here eventually over the next number of months. So maybe maybe we'll put something different back there. Maybe I will put a green screen and be, able, well, maybe not. I don't like green screens. As a, as a general rule, I do not like to use green screens. They are too complicated to get green screens to, uh, to work properly. Uh, but but it's one where I don't even have the pilot light turned on on that one right now because it's so warm outside. Right now, as we sit here in my studio, the air conditioner is on, mostly because the lights are on here and they do create a bit of warmth in here. Uh, but right now outside, the high today is going to be 82 degrees Fahrenheit. It's warm outside. Now, I'm in short sleeves and, and shorts still here in Florida. So we never really had that winter come through yet, maybe eventually in the January timeframes, it will get super cold. But right now, not too much. Thank you, uh, Celsius people, for the 28 Celsius that matches that 82 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't, we don't understand how that works. It's, uh, it's very much that way. Yes, we have, uh, we have family. For those of you wondering, I often mention when Canada shows up, I always make sure I tell you that I'm going to let Mrs. Professor Messer know that uh, Canada has checked in. Uh, we do have family in Canada, so we try to keep up with the uh, with the coldness in and Vancouver area and Edmonton and uh, and Hamilton, we try to try to figure out what's going on up there, and they keep us surprised how things are doing. And then we get them down to Florida during the winter. It's there's a good reason to be in Florida because we can have our Canadian family come down and say hi. And that's always good too. Always fun to hang out on the beach with the Canadians. Never a, never a dull moment. Well, I think that brings us to a good stopping point for the study group for here the end of October and although there will be a 701 exam available on the 7th of November it will be released before our next study group maybe some of you will take that exam I'm still going back and forth over whether I want to take the exam or not but maybe I will too I don't know uh, but the only way you're going to know is if you come back to the next study group see how that works so at the end of November we would love for you to come back and do more of these. We love doing these study groups. Of course, we have our A-plus study groups, our Network Plus study groups, 
and our Security Plus study groups. If you ever want to know when the next one is going to be, you can check our calendar on our website. Go to professormesser.com slash calendar. We also have an events channel in our Discord, which matches the information that we put into our calendar. So either one of those will always be up to date with the latest goings on. Thank you so much for being here we love doing these, and we're so happy you're able to join us. Thank you so much for the messages and things you send throughout the month. And of course, if you stop by the Discord, please feel free to say hello and be able to meet some of the people that are there and get some more training and be ready for your certifications. It's something we like to do in our Discord and something we like to do with our study groups. Maybe it will work for you as well. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody. And this is for you. There it is.